Good afternoon. My name is Jean-Louis Briot. I'm a professor in the Zachary Department of Civil Engineering and holder of the Spencer J. Buchanan Chair at Texas A&M University. Welcome to the 16th Buchanan Lecture. After a few words of uh, introduction, I will call on Professor David Rosowski, who is the head of our uh, department. David will uh, give you an update uh, about the department and our progress. Then uh, Professor Zenon Medina Setina will come to the podium. Uh, Zenon joined our geotechnical group in uh, September uh, and he, uh, so he received his uh, PhD degree from John Hopkins University uh, working on risk analysis in geotechnical engineering. Spent two years at uh, the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute uh, where we recruited him. Uh, Zenon, where's Zenon? Zenon, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, so Dr. Medina Setina will introduce uh, Dr. George Goebel, who will deliver the uh, 2007 Terzaghi Lecture on Applications of Dynamic Methods to the Design and Installation of Driven Piles. Uh, you know that uh, Dr. Goebel is a pioneer of pile driving instrumentation and analysis. Uh, I recall telling him one day, George, I will not let you die until you write a book on pile driving. To which he answered, good, I'll never write it then. <laughs> but I do hope that you write such a book, George. After a discussion period, I'll uh, come back to introduce uh, Professor Stokey, who will then present the 16th uh, Buchanan Lecture entitled Increasing Role of Seismic Measurement in Geotechnical Engineering. After discussion period, I will ask Philip Buchanan to come and give the plaque to uh, Professor Stokey. I wanted to uh, recognize a few people uh, in the audience, uh, people that, I, that mean a lot to our program and our department. Uh, first, uh, Dara Hooper, who made the initial gift some 25 years ago to create the Buchanan Chair. Uh, nice to have him here. Uh, his generosity certainly has uh, paid off. Doug Flatt, thank you, Doug. Uh, another solid contributor to our program and always ready to help Aggies. Don Aviles, uh, also part of this core group of supporters and uh, actually past regent of the Texas A&M University system. George Cozart and uh, Tara Kong, uh, who made a very generous gift to create a fellowship for graduate students in geotechnical engineering. Uh, this year's recipient of the Tara Kong Fellowship are Michelle Bernhardt, Colin Darby, Jeremy Arguin, and Jennifer Nix. Uh, William Bowman and his wife uh, also made a very generous gift to create a fellowship for graduate students in geotechnical engineering. This year's recipient of the Bowman Fellowship is Michelle Bernhardt. Uh, I do not want to forget my good friend, uh, Philip Buchanan. Uh, you may have noticed that our department is now called the Zachary Department of Civil Engineering. Uh, Mr. Zachary has been a tremendous supporter of our department uh, for many years, and we decided to name the department after him. Of course, it didn't hurt that he gave $10 million to the department, <laughs> which obviously has had a significant impact on our progress, as Dr. Rodowski will, uh, will tell you about. Uh, this lecture series is made possible by the contributions of hundreds of uh, people who are listed at the beginning of the booklet, uh, thanks to all of you, the Buchanan Chair has now passed $2 million, which generates about $90,000 each year for me to use for professional purposes. Well, maybe not these days with the stock market the way it's going, but um, I use that for the financial support of graduate students, undergraduate students, younger colleagues working with me in research. 
for the development of geotechnical engineering innovations, such as the erosion function apparatus, uh, the Brio compaction device, for trips to publicize the good work done at Texas A&M University, for field trips for students, and to make the Buchanan Lecture available free of charge to all of you. By the way, the text of all the lectures uh, since uh, 1993 uh, are available on the websites and the videotapes are available for free if you're interested. Just drop me an email. So in essence, the funds of the Buchanan Chair give me a chance to dream and to develop some of those dreams. Um, I, I think it's very important to have dreams that I would encourage you to uh, achieve those dreams and, uh, and uh, persevere in your dreams. And I'll tell you a very short story uh, to exemplify the perseverance of a dream. Uh, this is the story of a, of a little girl. Uh, she's on the second floor of the house and the, fa the father is watching TV on the, on the uh, first floor. And the little girl says, Daddy, can you bring me a glass of water? And the father says, no, I gave you a glass of water already. Uh, just go to sleep. Two minutes later. Daddy, can you bring me a glass of water? Father says, no, I told you no, you're, you're trying to get away from this, just concentrate and go to sleep. Two minutes. Daddy, can you bring me a glass of water? So the father is really getting nervous and he says, listen, if you don't stop asking me, I'm gonna spank you. 10 minutes. Daddy, when you come up to spank me, can you bring me a glass of water? <laughs> so go, go, go after your dreams. On the administrative side, and as you may know, we no longer advertise the Buchanan Lecture by brochure in the mail. I send a lot of emails to various lists, but the best way to find out about next year's lecture is to go to our Buchanan Lecture website, uh, just Google Buchanan Lecture, and uh, you can get to the website. The 2009 uh, Buchanan Lecture will be posted on that site in the middle of the summer 2009. Lecture always takes place around this time of the year. It will also be advertised in the Geo Institute Geo Strata magazine and the Geo Institute monthly email one month before the lecture. Talking about the Geo Institute, I uh, just became president of the Geo Institute and I want to encourage you to be a member of the Geo Institute, to volunteer and participate in committees, to go to the GI conferences. Uh, the next one is in Orlando in March 2008, and to do what you can to improve the profession uh, through the GEO in Institute. Uh, sometimes people ask me why they should be members of the GI. My answer is simple. Uh, the GI is your professional family, and you have to be part of the family to make sure that the family continues to do well. Uh, we go back to Kennedy's classic words, ask not what the GI can do for you, but ask what you can do for the GI. So if you're not a GI member, please become one today. And if you are a member, step up your volunteer activities to help your professional family. I have a number of presidential initiatives. Uh, one is to create the student presidential group, where I will select a group of students nationwide to work directly with me through the year and develop and implement activities which would get students excited to become members of the GEO Institute and to inject some youth in our organization. One is to travel around the country to go talk to as many geotechnical local groups as I can and to convince them to become GEO Institute chapters. One is to find a solution about the complaints that I hear from our practitioner members that our journal of geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineering is not very useful to them. One is to bring to the leaders of our section and branches geotech groups to Washington to discuss the future of the Geo Institute. One is to develop webinars, which are web-driven seminars, so you do not have to travel to get your professional development hours, PDH units, for your PE license. I also wanted to share with you that I'm a candidate for president of the International Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering, ISSMG. The members of ISMG are 84 countries around the world who will cast their vote in October 2009 
in Alexandria, Egypt. A number of countries have already told me in writing that they would vote for me. That's good. But if, you're good, if you have good connections in foreign countries, uh, please uh, contact them. I could use your help. I have some ideas that I want to develop if elected, and I'll be glad to share those with you at the reception tonight. Well, that was a little bit long-winded, but I wanted to share with you some of these ideas. Now let me call on Dr. Rozovsky, head of the Zachary Department of Civil Engineering at Texas A&M University, to say a few words about our department. David. Welcome to Texas A&M University for our good friends down the road in Austin. Welcome to College Station. Um, and of course, if you came in from anywhere else, welcome to College Station as well. And to our own students, it's really great to see you as well. And to our faculty and staff, and, and perhaps most importantly, our former students and our distinguished speakers today, welcome. I think I got everybody. Uh, my name is David Brzovsky. I have the pleasure of serving as the head of the department. Uh, I, I'm a structural engineer. Um, I've been here now uh, a little over four years. And um, one of the things I always like to do is tell people about wh where we've been and where we're going. And, and it's an exciting story to tell. We have a long history, of course, and most of you in this room are familiar with, with the uh, importance of civil engineering to the state of Texas and the importance of civil engineering to this institution as well as to the other Texas institutions around the state. Uh, we're in a privileged position, I think, in the state of Texas because civil engineering as a profession uh, is, is so much of, of what drives the state's economy that we'll always remain in a privileged position. We'll always remain in a position where all of our graduates will have jobs and all of our, our, our students will, in, in fact, find meaningful careers in civil engineering. Uh, I heard recently a statistic, and I, I can't source it, but it came out of somebody in the governor's office that in 2007, 25% of all the new jobs that were created in the United States were created in the state of Texas. And that's a staggering statistic if you reflect on that. So I think times are, are as good as they can be here, particularly for engineers, particularly for civil engineering graduates. Um, our department is very large. Our department is far and away the largest department of civil engineering in the country, uh, with now 73 faculty members, um, about 1,200 undergraduates, and about 400 graduate students. Um, we're, we're very, very large. Uh, that may be the byproduct of being a land-grant school in the state of Texas, uh, but b perhaps more, more significantly, we're, we're a very strong program. We're, we're ranked in the top 10 both in our undergraduate program and our graduate program, and of course this state is very privileged to have two such schools and we're privileged to have our guest here today from Austin. I, I, um, I speak often about civil engineering to broader audiences, and, and I've started to, to refer to this sort of second great era of civil engineering that we're about to enter, uh, perhaps the first being when we, when we started building lots of big buildings and lots of dams and lots of large networked infrastructure systems uh, at the turn of the last century. Today, uh, we're probably through the point where civil engineering is viewed only as a mature technology. I think today we're viewed as, as a critical combination of technologies that will be brought to bear on solution to the great challenges that we face as a country and, and as a planet. In fact, if you look at the National Academy of Engineering's 14 grand challenges and you kind of slice them up in a way that makes some sense to, to engineers and then to civil engineers, you, you see a lot of common themes. And, and four common themes that I consistently see in all of these grand challenges are energy, transportation, water, and sustainable infrastructure. So this certainly speaks to the next great era and great set of challenges and I believe solutions that will come out of civil engineering. So when I'm talking to kids coming out of high school, uh, I think I have a, a, a good story to tell and I can speak with, with great confidence that civil engineering is a, is a tremendously valuable degree for them to study at this time. Uh, I happen to be spending the day today working uh, on a, a strategic planning exercise for the College of Engineering here at A&M. Um, and, and it's really interesting what's happening. We're, we're, we're whittling down our, our research priorities to a handful that will guide us over the next one to two decades in the College of Engineering. And I can't, I, I, you can't hold me to these because I'm going back to finish hammering these out. But, but listen to what the four large cross-cutting research themes are likely to be for the College of Engineering and I believe will be echoed by other colleges. One is energy, water, and the environment. Another, national security. Another, health care, and that's broadly defined to be very inclusive, uh, technological materials, uh, uh, pharmaceutics, uh, personalized medicine, health care delivery, and so forth. And the fourth, infrastructure and transportation. Those are the 
college likely to be the college-wide research priorities for the next two decades, and they include energy, water, and the environment, and infrastructure and transportation. We're, we're anything but a mature technology that's trying to stay relevant in today's economy and, and today's most pressing needs. We're, in fact, right at the crux of the matter. Um, just last week, I heard uh, the founder of Engineers Without Borders speak, and I'll leave you with a statement that he made in his talk. Uh, in the next two decades, almost two billion additional people are expected to populate the Earth, 95% of whom will be in developing or underdeveloped countries. This growth will create unprecedented demands for energy, food, land, water, transportation, materials, waste disposal, earth moving, health care, environmental cleanup, telecommunication, and infrastructure. And it doesn't take a civil engineering degree to realize that civil engineers are going to be uh, at the forefront of solving these challenges as well. In fact, geotechnical engineers will be at the forefront of solving many of these challenges. I wish you a very, very pleasant afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming to visit us at Texas A&M University. Thank you to the speakers for speaking to us today. And Jean-Louis, thank you for letting me speak. Howdy. Howdy. My name is uh, Senor Medina Cetina, and it is a great pleasure for me, uh, three-month-old faculty in geotechnical engineering, to introduce a living legend in geotechnical science, practice, and education, Dr. George Gobel. Uh, Dr. Gobel is a fellow Fulbright Scholar, successful entrepreneur, former U.S. Air Force officer and captain, a big cake eater, who also happened to be a structural engineer. Um, uh, and at one point in history, a persistent pilot eager to land in Aguiland for a presentation following repeating and perhaps confusing orientation by the air controller. So we're very happy today that you didn't have to pass through that again and that you're safely here with us. Dr. Gobble received a Bachelor in Science degree in Civil Engineering at the University of Idaho and a Master in Science and PhD in Civil Engineering from the University of Washington, Seattle. After two years in the U.S. Air Force, he worked as a structural inspector for the Oregon Department of Transportation and as a structural designer for Marshall Barr and Associates of Seattle, Washington. Um, in 1961, he joined the faculty of Case Institute of Technology, now Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. During the next uh, 15 years, he taught structures and mechanics courses there and was active in research on the dynamics of pile driving, structural optimization, bridge testing, and experimental structural behavior. He was chairman of the civil engineering department from 1975 to 1977. He then joined the faculty of the University of Colorado, Boulder, as department chairman of civil engineering. He retired from the University of Colorado in 1992. He has published about 125 papers in the areas of structural optimization, structural laboratory testing, dynamics and field testing of pile driving, field testing of bridges, determination of soil properties from dynamic measurements, geotechnical centrifuge testing, and safety evaluation of foundations and structures using probability analysis. In 1972, he founded Pile Dynamics, the manufacturer of the pile driving analyzer and other measurement equipment for the pile driving industry. The PDA is now used in about 45 countries. He was also the founder of Gobble and Associates, consulting engineers, now GRL engineers, specializing in dynamic monitoring of pile driving and design of pile driving hammers and equipment. Gobble and Associates developed the WEAP program for the wave equation analysis of pile driving in 1976. In 2000, after his withdrawal from Pile Dynamics and GRL, he founded uh, George G. Gobble Consulting Engineering to serve as a vehicle for his specialized consulting interest, primarily in the deep foundations area. In 1989, he founded Bridge Diagnostics, a firm specializing in field testing and evaluation of bridges. Dr. Gobble received the ASC Collingwood Prize in 1965 the fifth award of the Lincoln Arc Welding Foundation Professional Structural Design Competition in 1966, the ASC Martin Cap Award of 1988, and the D Foundation Institute Distinguished Service Award of 1995. 
in 2004, geotechnical publication number 125, Current Practices and Future Trends in the Foundations, was published in, or, in his honor by the ASE. In 2007, he was invited to present the Geo Institute Terzaghi Lecture. Dr. Gobo is a licensed uh, structural engineer in Washington and a licensed civil engineer in Ohio and Wyoming. Please join me to welcome Dr. George Gobo. Well, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I always enjoy coming to Texas A&M. Uh, one trip, as you heard, was flying an airplane and I, uh, well, I'll tell you the whole story. That was my first long cross country, and uh, I got close to Texas A&M, and I called the tower, and there came something back I couldn't understand. So I said, as one says at a time like that, say again, please. I did that four times, and I, I guess I have a little trouble with the Texas accent. I didn't understand them. So I thought, well, it can't be that important. So I flew on in, and I was about a half mile out, and nothing seemed to be happening, so I, I told him where I was, and I, I learned a lot more about the Texas language at that point. <laughs> well, it, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank John Louis for inviting me to come. Uh, when I received the, the invitation to present the Tertsagi Lecture, I thought maybe somebody was playing a joke on me. Uh, Steve Wright from, from uh, University of Texas had called me, and I, didn't, I knew him casually, and I thought, you know, he wouldn't do something like that. I'm a structural engineer, as you heard. Uh, I got involved in the driven pile area, and uh, at one stage I had to make a decision whether I'm going to continue working in that area or continue in the structural optimization area. And you know, driven piles are a lot more interesting. Now, I would say that this is one area of geotechnical engineering which is probably somewhat more friendly to a structural engineer. I wanted to mention one other thing before I, before I start. Uh, you know, geotechnical engineers should start thinking in design about comparative cost. Structural engineers have done that for a long time particularly in the foundations area. A comparative cost evaluation can be made. There's a, a practicing geotechnical engineer in Milwaukee that's doing that routinely. Uh, uh, he calculates dollars per ton. And, and I would suggest that you all should consider looking at that. Well, okay, so let's get on with, with this. Uh, I will talk about first wave equation analysis. I want to say something about hammer performance characteristics, wave propagation, uh, the application of Newton's second law in, uh, in capacity determination, and then uh, some uh, discussion of signal, signal matching, and, and I've got a nice example. And if there's enough time, I, I have a hobby, and that's uh, the standard penetration test. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some recent work I did there. You know, this, this uh, capability, I think, is one of the most interesting thing, things for, for us that has occurred, that occurred in the 20th century. Uh, this concept was developed by, by Mr. Smith, uh, then chief engineer of the Raymond Company. He was chief engineer, and he also carried this thing all the way through to application. Uh, the concept must have been initially generated by, by Smith in, in the early 40s. And he carried that on. He, he uh, got the thing programmed. Uh, I've talked with Lee Lowry about this. I have to believe that it was programmed by IBM. Uh, Lee has suggested that, that Smith did it himself. Uh, he developed the means of, of using this tool, brought it into application. One man. I think that, uh, well, my, my late uh, good friend Bob Schiffman, who worked in the computer area, a, a geotechnical engineer, and he thought this might have been the first civilian application of electronic digital computers in, in, in civil engineering, in, in the engineering area. Uh, 
I think it might also have been the first application of, of a discrete model in, in uh, engineering analysis. Now, this only recently occurred to me. Generally, that's been credited to Ray Clough from the University of uh, California then, but this must have preceded uh, Clough. So, a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, I think particularly because he carried it from beginning all the way to application. The, and that was, of course, a, 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 a proprietary program. The first public domain program was written here at Texas A&M by, by Chuck Sampson and uh, uh, Teddy Hirsch and Lee Lowry with uh, somewhat later contributions uh, from Harry Coyle. Uh, this was uh, done for the Texas uh, DOT. It was a public domain program and it was widely used in the offshore oil industry. Curiously to me, and I'm, I'm outside the area somewhat, is how long it's taken to implement this capability in, in other areas, in land work. Uh, when I started doing research in this area in 1964, uh, I assumed that everybody used the wave equation. And gradually I learned that, in fact, the implementation was certainly not complete, and it's not really complete today. I have a little trouble understanding that. The uh, next program was written uh, by Goebel and Associates. Uh, Frank Rausch did most of the work. And the motivation for writing that was to include a thermodynamic analysis and diesel hammers. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, about uh, how that hammer works. Very quickly, this is the Smith model. You've all seen this thing a hundred times. We have, in this case, uh, an air steam hammer and, and this one-dimensional model. We'll talk a little bit more about, about the soil model. For diesel hammers, we have to include the thermodynamics performance of combustion there, and again, I'll talk uh, a little bit more about that later. Now, the soil model, Again, this is the Smith model, elastic plastic, and, and here's a description of, of the static resistance uh, to describe this elastic plastic uh, behavior. The dynamic resistance gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, we say, well, that's a linear relationship, but it's not really. Uh, one approach that Smith produced was to say, we'll, we'll multiply a constant J, a damping constant, times the static resistance, which is of course nonlinear, times the velocity. Uh, and that continues today to be the most commonly used model. At one point, uh, this is a joke that I put that name there, but it seemed kind of convenient to, to not mess with this part of the curve. Finally, at case, we use this model J times the pile impedance. Now, you know, we sometimes talk back and forth with these guys from, tech, from Texas A&M, and we said, well, the problem with this is that J has units. You know, this is uh, feet per second, and this is kips, and we got kips over here. So J is seconds per foot. And that seems like you shouldn't have a constant with units. And so we'd said something like that to the guys here, and they said, well, why would damping be related to the pile impedance? And probably, uh, you know, that probably their, their comment is more appropriate than, than ours. Smith also developed the, the application tool. This is something we call a bearing graph. And so now what he did is he said, I'll use a number of specified axial resistances and calculate for each one the displacement for that resistance. So I can plot this curve here that we call the bearing graph. Now, if, uh, let's say, I desire and design a capacity like this, then I can come over here and down here and say, this is the blow count that's, that's required. Likewise, I can go up, here's the function of, of the compression stress as a function of a blow count, and pick off the compression stress. This is a process that, uh, that should be done always during uh, the design process process of evaluating drivability. If I observe a blow count, then of course I can go the other way. 
and, and that, that uh, was developed by, by Smith. Well, I say wave mechanics for poor people. Uh, you know, the problem that we have in things like this at universities, you say, well, now uh, we can take this, uh, this model, this element model, and uh, we'll, apply, uh, uh, we'll apply Newton's second law, and we end up with a second order partial differential equation, and, and we're going to now find the solution for that. I think maybe we've, and I'm included as one of those, we spend too much time on that in the teaching process. So in this case, we're going to skip that sort of thing. So what, what do we mean by, by wave propagation? If we, if we apply a force suddenly at the end of a pile or a rod, that's a disturbance which generates a wave that travels along the pile. And when that wave passes a point, that point's going to displace. And if it displaces, it'll be displacing with some velocity and some acceleration. Of course, a force is induced as well. And and that could be represented as by a stress and a strain. So these quantities are related, and these quantities up here are related by this simple, uh, by, by methods we're, we're familiar with. So what we really need to do is to, to relate stress to motion, or force to motion, and, and that's what the, the, the wave equation gives us. So now here's the, the useful stuff. Uh, we can calculate the wave speed, the speed at which this wave travels along the pile. It's the square root of the modulus divided by the mass density. So it's a material property. Uh, for example, in steel, it, the wave travels at 16,800 feet per second. So it, it's, it's moving along pretty fast. Some units, if, uh, if a wave propagates unchanged, it propagates unchanged along a pile uh, for a uniform cross-section. And compression we treat as positive, turned around from everybody else, and a down velocity is positive. If you have a fixed end, an absolutely fixed end, then the reflection will be compression of a compression wave. That's intuitively reasonable. And uh, a velocity will reflect as an up velocity. Uh, free end does the opposite. So here's the, the useful relationships and the thing you need to be familiar with if you're going to work in this area. A force is, is equal to Ea divided by C, the modulus times the area, divided by the wave speed, times the velocity. So we have a relationship between force and velocity. Uh, it's, it's really more convenient to use stress, so that becomes E over C. For steel, E over C is about 1.8. So now, uh, if we have a hammer stroke that's three feet, say an air hammer, uh, then the transmitted impact velocity will be maybe somewhere around 11 feet per second. A free fall would be more like 14 feet per second. So if we say, well, there's a transmitted uh, velocity of 11 feet per second, that's an impact stress of 19.8 KSI. Now, we have, uh, today we're using steels uh, in piling with a yield point of 50 KSI. So you see, if we have to depend on that and that only, then we're not going to be able to generate or to take the uh, use of that high strength steel. So we'll talk about, uh, but, but now let's say, let's say we use a diesel hammer, the impact velocity might be more like 20, and so now you've got 36 KSI for that first peak stress. And, and that, of course, has the advantage of, of making better use of the, of the steel. I want to talk about the other factor that's important. So we talked about impact velocity and its, port, its importance in generating the forces necessary to drive a pile. The ram weight, the ratio of, of the, uh, the pile ram weight is a very important parameter as well. Well, so what do we do here? We take this mass, we impact it on the end of a rod, and this is a perfect impact. So at impact, we generate uh, velocity there equal to, the, to the, the velocity of the mass at impact. Now, if you generate a stress there, of course, you generate a force against the mass. That slows the force of the mass down, and you can, you can assume that's going to be a, 
uh, uh, an exponential decay. Well, that's a, an ordinary, first order ordinary differential equation. If we solve that, uh, we get a relationship like this. Uh, sigma one is the stress at impact, and, and sigma is the current stress. So if we divide by the impact stress, that, that gives us a dimensionless uh, uh, relationship. With some operation, we, we get a value here for the, uh, for the exponent of minus alpha times the mass of the pile divided by the mass of the ram. In order to get to that, we've, uh, we've uh, made a quantity alpha times L over C. We've replaced T by, by this parameter. L over C, that's, remember, the length divided by the wave speed. Uh, that's, uh, that's the time required for the wave to travel the length of the pile. So if we look at this, then alpha is this quantity that, that gives us the, the number alpha is going to represent the number of pile lengths that this uh, wave has traveled. So now if we, uh, if we, if we, take, uh, we take this equation and we plot it up, for a number of pile ram weight ratios. And I started with 0.5, so we have uh, a relatively heavy ram. And this might be typical of a, a ram on a steel pile. That conceivably could be uh, considerably lighter. So with increasing values, maybe this is something like a concrete pile. And down in here, this might look like an offshore application. Of course, you don't have an, 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 uh, an, an absolute uh, vertical uh, development of the, of the uh, force. And so here's a, a representation of, of a hammer blow. Actually, it was generated by wave equation analysis. So we see here, uh, and remember, the force and velocity are proportional. Uh, the velocity is represented by this dashed line, and I'll say velocity when I really mean EA over C times V. It, because they're proportional, it's convenient to look at, at, at this quantity in that way. So here, oh, and, and, and I'm modeling this pile here. Uh, there's a resistance force here and a resistance force here, nothing at the toe. So now, at impact, those two, uh, velocity and force are the same. And when the wave reaches this point, some of it reflects back to the top. Some of this force reflects back to the top, and a reduced velocity reflects back to the top. So now what we see here, here's our, our force then. That's been, that, that has increased at the top of the pile by that reflection. And the velocity has been reduced. And the wonderful thing about this is the distance between those two is the magnitude of that resistance. So that, that becomes right there the basis of a cap lap analysis. There's one problem, however. This quantity is, is the total resistance, that is a static resistance, and the dynamic resistance. And, and the, that means that you can't just say, OK, this is the static force act. The wave gets to this point, and there's a larger reflection, and so there's nothing at the toe. You get an increase in velocity. And, and uh, so let's look at now something more realistic. Here's some measurements. And, and those of you that are, that are out in the field where some guy's doing a, 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 a PDA analysis, taking data, you, you can impress him if you say, well, OK, here's, here's our force. That's the, sh the shaft resistance above that point in the pile. So we've had this shaft resistance develop, a large increase in velocity because the pile doesn't have much resistance at the toe. And uh, the force goes down a little bit past zero because the measurements were made a little bit lower than the top of the pile. Now we can see that's easy driving. We can see it in another way. If we integrate the velocity here, that gives us the displacement. And you can see there's a lot of displacement. 
Okay, we drive a little bit further. Now we still have this shaft resistance, but the force takes a big jump up here. And uh, so we must have hit something with the toe of the pile, therefore this increase in force. And I want to make the point here, this reflection, the size of that reflection, is not only dependent on, on the, the total resistance at the toe, it's also dependent on, on the magnitude of the ram pile weight ratio. So here you see this magnitude here might get larger than the first peak. And in some cases, it can get a lot larger. So in this way, we can use an air hammer with a heavy ram and this low impact velocity to generate a large enough force to drive the pile more effectively. The problem with that is that if the piles are of different length, then you, you can't predict how high that's going to go. But that's one of the reasons that, a, that a, a heavy rammed air hammer is as effective as it is. Okay, so now we go away for a couple of weeks and we come back and hit it again. And, and we see this large amount of shaft resistance here. No sign of any toe resistance. It seems to be all shaft resistance. The, the velocity uh, reflects back and becomes to zero before the 2L over C time. So now here uh, we have then mobilized little or none of the toe resistance. And, and this is one of the problems with dynamic testing. Uh, those of us that work in that area have suggested that you might take the capacity determined in this case, where we got a toe resistance, and add that to the shaft resistance. Of course, uh, geotechnical engineers get a little uncomfortable with that, and, and I think there's a good justification, uh, because you don't really know how much of this was something from the shaft or from the toe. I want to talk a little bit about, I'm going to come back to this topic, but I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about uh, operational characteristics of hammers, and particularly diesel hammers. A diesel hammer is something that we're really only gradually understanding. It was, it was invented by the Germans in the 20s, came to the United States shortly after the war, and, and these hammers have some kind of interesting characteristics, so I want to make sure you understand what happens. We have a cylinder, a ram in it that tends to be long and slender. Uh, there's an exhaust port right here, and something we call an impact block down here. So the ram will impact on that block. And uh, so now, uh, if, we if we start on the downstroke, the ram falls under gravity. It closes this exhaust port here and begins to compress the gas in the chamber. At one point, it passes some sort of a triggering device that injects fuel into the, into the chamber. That, that comes in, in most cases, in a liquid form. Okay, so now we've, we've come all the way down, and uh, so the piston hits the impact block, and the impact block moves down, leaving the cylinder up in the air. We don't want to tie the impact block to the cylinder because the hammer operation, the hammer impact, would, would damage the cylinder. There's a rubber ring right here. The cylinder falls, and, and it lands on that rubber ring. So the impact sends a stress wave down the pile, uh, pressure and temperature in the, uh, in the chamber become high enough that combustion occurs. Uh, this, these hammers have typically a compression ratio of about 13 to 1, uh, so the diesel fuel combusts. And the combustion also sends a stress wave into the pile. But in hard driving, this is trivial. Uh, in easy driving, this might, might be useful. Now, in very easy driving, this hammer won't run because it doesn't get sufficient reaction to get enough, uh, enough rebound of the hammer to, to scavenge when, uh, when it ra the ram passes the port. Okay, so, so now in the last stage, the ram, the ram uh, travels up under the action of the rebound and the uh, compressed gases, the uh, gas in the chamber, and uh, it, it goes past the exhaust port 
the excess pressure blows off, the rising piston brings in fresh air and, and scavenges the, the chamber for the, next, uh, for the next hammer blow. So it relies under the, under the decelerating uh, effects of gravity and the stroke will depend on, to a considerable degree, on the magnitude of the resistance force that's, that's resisting the penetration of the pile. Now, there's one characteristic here that we hadn't really looked at very much. If you're driving concrete piles, you're concerned about a reflected wave in easy driving, that is a tension wave, cracking the pile. And, and the diesel hammer has a big advantage because prior to passing the port, you still have compression in the chamber which continues to extend that stress wave. So that means that you have some advantage in dealing with, uh, with uh, reflected tension forces. So now we talk a little bit about the application of Newton's law uh, in uh, determining pile capacity. This was the basic computational method that was developed by Nera and Iber. Nera was department chairman at Case when I arrived there. <coughs> Iber had finished a master's thesis somewhat earlier. And uh, in the master's thesis, they, uh, they ran some tests in a bucket of sand in the lab. Uh, at impact, they measured the acceleration and then assumed that those two things were moving together. Newton's second law, they, they looked at, at the acceleration times the mass at the instant of zero velocity and said, okay, at the instant of zero velocity, obviously there's no dynamic resistance. It's unfortunate that that's not true, but that gave them a basis. They ran a number of tests and not, not bad results considering how, how uh, simple uh, the, the tests were. Uh, Nara had suggested to me when I arrived that I might, li might like to investigate this. Spent a lot of effort trying to, to generate uh, funds. Uh, at that time, uh, Bob Scanlon, who uh, later left Case and, and went to Princeton, became famous in suspension bridge uh, vibration. Was we were we had did su succeed in getting funding from the Ohio DOT. We started with a model that looked like this, so we didn't have to make the assumption that the ram and the pile are moving together. We've got uh, cushions and all sorts of things in there, so that's not realistic. So now we measure the acceleration, we measure the force, we have a resistance force here, the mass of the pile, and we can apply, uh, again, Newton's second law to this relationship here where we have the, for the measured force, again at the instant of zero velocity, and from that calculate the resistance. And that didn't work too badly. And this is, this is the basic method that Statnamic uses today. They have some multiplizers in there to try and deal with, uh, with the dynamic resistance, but that's basically the, the Statnamic method. Uh, Frank Rausch in his dissertation, and this was really a masterwork. It, it's about that thick. It's written in German English, so it isn't exactly what you'd call easy reading, but a, a remarkable accomplishment. He generated the capability to determine the, uh, uh, the uh, pile capacity assuming an elastic, uh, an elastic pile. Now, what comes out of that, this expression here, the force at time one, the force at time two, at a time two I'll ever see later, half of that, half of the difference in the velocities at the same time, these velocities times, times the impedance, will give you the total resistance to penetration. And that is the total resistance to penetration. This is, there's no engineering in that, it's science. That is the, the, the resistance to penetration. The problem is that that, again, includes a dynamic resistance. So 
We have to do something about that. Now, actually, to, to apply this, you have to take this, uh, these two quantities and slide them along the, uh, the measured force and obtain what is the largest quantity here, which isn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily begin at that impact force. Rausch had generated this relationship, which, which has got quite a bit of engineering in it. And, and it involves a dimensionless uh, quantity, J. And you can see now why that, why that becomes dimensionless, because we have to have the pile impedance here. So, you know, you can argue that uh, there's no relationship between damping and impedance. But, but this made this approach possible. Uh, there's an assumption in here that assumes that all the damping is concentrated at the toe, and now with that assumption you can de derive this relationship to determine the dynamic resistance to penetration. Subtract that from the total resistance, and you have a, a static capacity. And we used that for some considerable period of time. It's still in use. The whole question is what do you use for J? Uh, that's always a problem. What do you use for J? Uh, well, we had a lot of, of opportunity for correlation. Uh, there's a problem because the correlation between soil properties and J is, is, pretty, is pretty wide. Uh, if you have a means of determining J by back calculating, that is, if you have a better method for determining determining this total resistance to penetration, then you can calculate J. And I'll talk about a better means of getting that information. Now, that's something we call a signal matching analysis. It was a, 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 a capability that uh, got the name CAPLAP. That's Case Pile Wave Analysis Program. You gotta, if you write a program, you gotta give it a name, you know? And so that was my contribution to this whole thing. Rausch also did this, uh, and so now this is an inverse process. Normally when we do an analysis, we have the structural properties or soil properties, if you will. We have applied loads, and we calculate resistance characteristics. Uh, in this case, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're going in the opposite direction, so here's, here's a, a, a a description of the way this works. Now again, if we were using a direct calculation, we, uh, we would uh, uh, take this measured force, the known resistances, and calculate the, the applied force. But we want to go the other direction. We have the measured force, we assume resistances, and from the assumed resistances we calculate this uh, this, uh, the calculated force, we compare the calculated force with the measured force, and when those two agree, then we say we have a capacity. So we measure the force, uh, says the acceleration will usually integrate that to velocity. We compute the, this computed force with assumed values of resistance, and we compare then these two, we, uh, we adjust the resistances until we get some reasonable match. And we say that if that match, if that matches well, then that must be a good prediction of capacity. And if you have this capacity prediction, then you can take those numbers and put them into this thing we call the case method equation that I just talked about, and, and in that way, uh, you, can, you can calculate a J, and it gives you a better, a better uh, tool for the case method. So what happens? This is, uh, is oversimplified, but uh, let's say here's our, here's our calculated or measured force, the solid line. So now we assume some resistances, and, and we get this calculated force. That's got a match, so make adjustments in the resistance uh, magnitude and, and uh, and uh, distribution, and work your way up until you good, get a good match. And we say, 
that with that match, we know uh, we know a reliable prediction of uh, of pile capacity. So what do we get? We get total capacity. We get resistance distribution on the toe and the shaft. We get the damping constant, toe and shaft. We get the toe quake. Now remember what the quake was. That was the displacement at which the Smith model of, of force displacement relationship, that was the point where it went from elastic to plastic. And uh, we get a load, a load test curve for the toe and the shaft. Here's, the, here's what the load test curve is going to look like, and, and here's a comparison. This is a static load test here, and here is the, the static load test calculated from the CAPLAP analysis. This is the force displacement relationship at the toe, and this is the Davison failure criteria. Now, I don't know if you're all familiar with the Davison failure criteria. The Davison failure criteria, you start with a specified uh, displacement, and this line is determined from the axial pile flexibility. That is, this pile out here alone loaded to get, to get the displacement over a length. And it's the, probably the primary approach that's used for defining capacity for driven piles. I can take some credit for that. Uh, Tom Davison and I were never exactly close friends, but, but uh, when, I, when I started on the case project, uh, we used the, uh, the definition of failure that the Ohio DOT used, and they used a slope definition. So now you've got the curve up here, and, and, and at the point where the specified slope is tangent to the curve, that's the capacity. So now, early on, the graduate students, we would get some data, the graduate student would come in and uh, wouldn't agree all that well. So I would say, well, go back and take another look at it. He comes back in, good agreement. So what happened? Well, I hadn't plotted the load test curve up very well. You're talking about slope, so with a little bit of change in the way you go through all those scattered points, you get a different point that, that's uh, tangent. And it concerned me because that, that, uh, that seemed to me you're, you're, you're asking for trouble when you do this. And I, I discovered the Davison method, and, and there you can give that data to two graduate students and expect them both to come up with about the same quantity, which, which makes this, I think, a a useful tool, and, and that's become pretty much the standard tool that's used in, in evaluating pile capacity today. Here's a, a, a test that, that used, uh, uh, used a CAPLAP to determine the capacity. This is a pretty spectacular job. This is an elevated roadway being built in Tampa, and uh, so there's this uh, shaft here supported on a monopile, a mono shaft, and there was a failure. That was kind of interesting. The, the, one of these shafts went down 11 feet in a few seconds. Uh, and so as a result of that, there was some concern for, for the safety of this, of this highway, and they wanted to test some using a dynamic test. This is a large hydraulic camera, 40 ton ram, and, and so I think a dozen of those shafts were tested with this, with this ram, determined capacities from the dynamic test. Interestingly though, uh, Dan Brown was a consultant on this and, and he was required to, count, to, to determine capacities from, uh, from uh, uh, geotechnical considerations before these te this test was run. And the comparison between the two were really pretty damned impressive. I, I think that in, in, in the area of determining pile capacity from static analysis, he's, he's probably about as good as they come. I want to show you some results of uh, tests that were run a site in southwest Louisiana. They were building uh, LNG tanks. 
There were three LNG tanks. Each one had, I'm not sure what the final number was, about 1,400 piles under them. The soil conditions, and I'm, 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 I'm smearing this, so it, it's sort of an average condition. It was 10 feet of desiccated clay fill, uh, about 60 feet of soft clay, and uh, then a dense sand, uh, a variable thickness, and then, and then uh, clay underneath it. I, I was, I was uh, retained by the, by the geotechnical engineer, and so when I looked at this, I said, you know, wouldn't it be useful to draw uh, uh, contour lines on that sand thickness? It was, it was an interesting experience because he was something less than enthusiastic <laughs> about the idea. But there was a structural engineer involved, a structural designer, so, so he did that. It was really very useful. They drove 18-inch square pre-stress concrete piles, and under each tank there were 12 piles tested dynamically and four piles tested statically. These, of course, had a lot of, of setup in the clay, so it was necessary to do restrike testing to determine the capacity. And piles were driven with a D30 hammer, and the D30 would not mobilize both the shaft and the toe after setup. So I beat at them long enough to bring in a larger hammer. It was a D46, and it was not a very good performing D46, so it wasn't all that much better. But I want to show you some some what I thought very interesting results. Well, here's sort of typical conditions. Again, there was a lot of variability. Uh, sort of typical end of drive uh, capacities, maybe 420 kips on the toe and 80 kips on the shaft for a total of 500 kips. Now again, I'm smearing a bunch of, of uh, pile <laughs> test results out. The data obtained at the beginning of restrike, you saw 250 kips on the toe, 300 kips on the shaft for 550 kips, so it's only gone up by 50 kips. But if you look at the toe resistance here and here, you see that it's, there's a lot less. That toe is in the sand, so you're not mobilizing that capacity. Uh, I'll, sh I'll show you a measurement. Now this is uh, the way uh, the way pile dynamics uh, has uh, has set up for determining uh, uh, a reporting of the results. Here are the measurements. So we see a peak force uh, along here. There's the velocity. That up velocity comes from the toe, and that's probably what we call a, a large quake phenomena. That is, if the quake is large, then that that uh, displacement has to be that, that displacement has to be consumed before you can uh, mobilize any any permanent set, and and typically you'll see uh, you'll see something like that. Shaft resistance here, uh, here are the capacities are given, and and here's the the load test curve. Now I want to look at this load test curve because there's some kind of interesting results there I think. So this was. On one pile, the second blow. Now, cap lap analyses are expensive enough that they normally will only analyze one hammer blow. So here's this load test curve. That's the top of the pile. It rebounds to about a tenth of an inch permanent set. The toe went up here and came back down more or less along the same line. You'll notice it didn't come all the way down. So now what do we see that's unusual and strange about this? This is an 18-inch square pre concrete pile, and the top of the pile had a larger permanent set than the toe. So now, either that thing is going to get turned inside out, or there must be some other explanation. So this is a case of, of residual stresses. And it, it, it really surprised me, because this is a a, a rather stiff pile, not loaded to terribly high capacities. And, and yet, there's this difference with that much residual stress. Capacity not mobilized, because the toe displacement 
didn't mobilize the capacity. Here's another, another test uh, on another pile. It, I, I can't have the same pile because that data wasn't available, but it's a nice illustration. In this case, the, the guy that did the cap pipe analysis chose to look at blow number eight. People doing that kind of analysis, they say, well, this is a good blow, whatever that is. So that's blow number eight. Now look at the load test curve here. So again, about a tenth of an inch displacement, and the toad had as much permanent set as the shaft. So this was hit enough, in my opinion, to destroy some of the shaft friction and therefore mobilize the toe. So this also does not give you a correct measure of capacity of this number here. You know, I talked about engineering uh, design and installation, and this is, I think, a remarkable job of, of engineering a pile installation. <coughs> Contractor was uh, D.R. Jordan of Mobile, Alabama. Boy, there's a, there's a real neat guy. And when, when D.R. Jordan talks to you, with that syrupy accent, you sort of feel like getting a hold of your billfold, you know. The piles were, had a 36 inch square cross section, had an 18 inch void, 18 inch diameter void in the center. The pile length was originally specified by the DOT to be 150 feet in one piece. It was going to be driven by the general contractor uh, and so he, he, he drove that 150 foot long pile, they load tested it, it didn't make the capacity. So the DOT said we ought to go to 180 feet, and again in one piece. And the, the, the general contractor said it's not possible, and DR said, I think I can drive them piles. <laughs> That's my effort at a southern accent. So here's a pile that had a weight of of 200 kips, it was driven with a D62 hammer, that's a diesel hammer, and the pile ram weight ratio is 14. Now this is, uh, most uh, specifications when I started working in this area would have limited that ratio to four. So here he's got this huge ratio. Of course, imagine what kind of a ram you'd have to have to get a ratio of four. The piles were driven into a, a soft clay with shaft resistance only. Uh, the, the project was a bridge across some bay of, uh, of the panhandle of Florida. I don't know exactly where it was. This is the job site. Now again, remember, that's a, that's a three foot square pile there. And there's a, a pier coming up. It's a two lane highway they're building. And here's this big ringer crane and another crane. It's a better view. Here's our, our pile barge, uh, a template to drive the piles into, this big crane, a smaller crane, and here are the leads. You'll notice that the leads are a bit short. huh? Here's this 180 foot pile and we're gonna use 100 foot of leads, but we only have uh, something less than that because the diesel hammer is, is in there. So they're picking up the pile, the big crane is up here and there's, there's a two point pickup here with the line over a shiv. Now I can show you most of the steps that they went through. Unfortunately, one of the most interesting steps, uh, DR didn't give me a photograph of that. So here, the pile is now almost in the vertical position and, uh, and this, this crane here will be cut loose from the pile. So here we are with this, this pile now on the ringer crane and, and this guy is going to reach over here and, and get, the, get the pile. They have to put the pile in this template. So now, come over with the pile, it's going into the template, they put the leads on, the pile ran under its own weight quite a ways in that soft clay. But you can see it's not all the way down. When they put the hammer down on the pile, the weight of the hammer caused it to run down to the point where the leads could go into the template. That was one of the things that they were very nervous about. Of course, they could have uh, brought out a longer set of leads. Well, how they got the leads on there isn't entirely clear to me. 
and there's usually a gate here at the bottom, so somebody had to, had to put a pin in that gate. And, and I, how that was done, I don't know. And here they're, they're finishing driving the pile. Now here's the hammer. Uh, if you look here, you can see it's a nine pile group, and six of those piles are batter piles. One and four batter. So they somehow put that 180 foot pile into the template on a batter and drove them successfully. They drove 100 piles on the job, uh, they broke one, and DR told me that that was because that was a poorly cast pile. Naturally, he's a piling contractor. Well, I have, have a little bit more time, so I want to show you something. I, I said I have a hobby, and that's the standard penetration test. Uh, I, I got involved in the standard penetration test a long time ago. It was uh, 1980, maybe. And I got involved with uh, the owner of, uh, of one of the manufacturers. And the question was, how do you make measurements on a standard penetration test? When, when Schmertman first worked in this area, he didn't succeed in getting acceleration measurements. And I, of course, said, well, it's because he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. But in fact, he did know what he was doing. If, if you have a steel-on-steel -steel impact, you get some very high-frequency components, and that will be in the natural frequency range of a piezoelectric accelerometer, and so the accelerometer gets overloaded, you think it's been broken, and it'll later recover. Accelerometers became available later that, that one could use, and I I spent a lot of test with, uh, time with a graduate student at, at our lab at uh, University of Colorado to determine what was the problem with the accelerometers. You know, this is one of these nice things you work on a long time, and you can't write a paper about it. Well, so then at, uh, at one stage, it occurred to me, now this was done for the love of the standard penetration test, not uh, nobody was paying for this. And I said the, the, the response should be a function of the rod area. And, and there's some wave mechanics behind that, that that I don't have time to go through. So I said, let's, let's look at that. Now, I ran, I ran several cases, the wave equation analysis. And in this case, I put enough resistance on the spoon to get a blow count of about 15. And this is with a rod length that's pretty short. As the rod length increases, this, uh, this A rod, which I used here, stays reasonably flat. It gets as high as from 15 up to maybe a little over 16, which is pretty damn close in standard penetration test. The N rod goes all the way up here, and it comes back down, and then goes down to zero. So up to, well, up to maybe uh, 100 feet, uh, you don't have this rapid fall off, but, but it's going to produce uh, uh, blow counts that are too high. As I say, the A-rod is pretty good. Now, why does this go plunging down? Well, that's because the weight of the rod is enough to, to, uh, to affect the, the penetration. So it, but it's still not a serious problem at something like 100 feet. The A-rod goes out here. Uh, I had had, over the years, a lot of contact with, uh, with uh, Minnesota DOT, and they probably have the best uh, SPT practice in the world. They, they use an auto hammer, and so now they had been using an auto hammer uh, of course, it's too efficient, so you have to do a correction on the data. So then they said, when they've got a lot of that around, did we correct this data or not? So at one stage, they said it would really make a lot more sense to put in the appropriate data, which generally represents a, an efficiency of about 60%. I think it's generally accepted. So they required their contractors, their contract drillers, to reduce the efficiency of that, of that driving system. And that could be done either by shortening the stroke 
or reducing the ram weight. Uh, that became standard practice for them. And, and uh, I think in a lot of the Midwest today, that's standard practice. I've been away from this area a little bit, but, but I think there's still a hell of a lot of, of cathead and ropes around. I don't know what the practice is here. It's interesting that at the area where the, where the standard penetration test is the most critical, maybe the West Coast where you have earthquakes, that's probably the worst practice in the country. Uh, so, you know, everybody should be doing this. I was on the ASTM, com ASTM committee for quite a while, and, and I finally quit because every meeting was shouted arguments and, and we weren't getting any place. But you see, the Minnesota DOT, their owner, so they could write their own specification. Well, so now my friend up there, Rich Lamb, wanted to see if, if that really happened. And when he got an opportunity, he would, he would try to drive, drive uh, uh, a, uh, an A-rod and an N-rod fairly close together. But, you know, those are glacial outwash soils and there's so much variability, you really, you really couldn't. You couldn't conclude anything. But then, he had a big job and they did a lot of SPT testing. You have to excuse me on this uh, slide. It's, it's got a lot of data on it. But, uh, this is the N-rod curve fit through this data. So it's behaving like you would expect compared with the A-rod, which is down here. Of course, every time you try to do something like this, you know, this had inserts, this one didn't. I, mean, I don't know how you ever get things to go the same. I'm not really that sure as a, as a really a non-geotechnical engineer how much effect that would have. I think if he had used a nonlinear fit on this N-rod, it would have curved down just by looking at the data that, that is represented there. But I think what's, and, and this, that was a, uh, an oddball drilling operation there. But I think what's really interesting is this CPT data. Uh, I, I have the impression that geotechnical engineers like geot SPTs. Now, I would say there's a fair amount of scatter in that. And uh, nobody laughed much. I, I thought that had, and and uh, so here's the, here's the fit he did on that with a nonlinear curve. Well, I'd like to thank you. I have said what I want to say. Is there a Time for a few questions. I think it's a soil property, but, or at least the soil, I, I think it's a soil property, or at least maybe something due to the soil pile interaction, but, but I would have assumed it's a soil property. And, you know, I've got an, an audience of geotechnical engineers that are probably more competent in that area than I am. There's one other point I wanted to make, since I've got a few minutes. Something that has disturbed me increasingly. Piles are driven to blow count. They're not driven to penetration. Why do you want to do a static analysis? Why do you want to do a static analysis? Well, you, you have to do that. Too. There's defense coming here. <laughs> you have to know what like the power for the network. Right. So that's for, the, that's for bid purposes. Yeah. That's for bid purposes. And what I'm seeing now in, in my practice is that piles are driven uh, to a selected penetration from static analysis. And there was recently a job on the East Coast, uh, piles were driven to rock in the ocean to a specified penetration. Now, the real problem was that the good Lord didn't make that rock flat. And there was a lot of problems with, with the job, you can imagine. 
I'm working on a, a project now where this is essentially the primary problem. Uh, so uh, I would say to you, don't forget that, that piles are driven to blow count, not to penetration, except, yeah, okay. except, yeah. except offshore. if you have scour. <laughs> oh, well. no, but offshore, uh, we, we yeah. drive to penetration. Why do you think the difference between offshore driving to penetration and the onshore driving to, to blow count? Well, because most of those piles offshore have variable, have variable wall thickness, so they have their primary strength at the, at the mud line. They have to end up in the right place. They have to end up in the right place. Any other questions? Thank you. If not, thank you. So I have a certificate of appreciation to thank Dr. George Goebel for delivering the 2007 Terzaghi Lecture at the occasion of the 16th Buchanan Lecture. Thank you very much. Thanks. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you my distinguished colleague, Professor Ken Stokey, the 16th Buchanan Lecture. Professor Stokey has become a giant in our field. He has done that through a series of innovations which have had a significant impact worldwide. Dr. Stokey has been working in the areas of in situ seismic measurements, laboratory measurements of dynamic material properties, and dynamic source structure interaction for the last 35 years. He was instrumental in developing the cross hole seismic method for in-situ shear wave velocity measurement, which is now used worldwide. He has developed a combined torsional shear resonant column system, which is now used by many universities and private firms in the US, Europe, and Asia to evaluate dynamic material properties. He and his colleagues have developed the spectral analysis of surface waves, SASW method, for testing geotechnical systems, pavement systems, and structural components. Dr. Stokey has been involved in the development of the rolling dynamic deflectometer with funding from TexDOT and federal agencies. He's the inventor of T-Rex, a huge ground shaking truck to penetrate into the deep layers of the earth to collect information by sensing the vibration response. I recall Ken calling me one day and saying, I would like to come to the national site to vibrate and shake the soil. And so I said, by all means, come over and, and uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do to help you. Well, I, uh, he came over and uh, 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 about a few hours later, I, I heard uh, uh, Ken on the telephone that said, oops, I broke the runway. And so he does mean business. When he shakes things, it's for real. Uh, Dr. Stokey has conducted major research projects in the areas of non-destructive testing in the field and laboratory evaluation of soil and rock stiffnesses under cyclic and dynamic loading conditions. Dr. Stokey has conducted major studies using the SASW method to evaluate earth dams for the US Bureau of Reclamation the Icelandic government in Delft Geotechnical Laboratory, and to evaluate debris slides for the US Geological Survey and the Italian government. He has also conducted extensive SASW investigation at the proposed high-level nuclear site at Yucca Mountain for the US Department of Energy, SASW investigation at Cannon International Airport in Reno, Nevada, the Sonoma County Airport in Santa Rosa, and JFK uh, Airport uh, in New York City to evaluate changes beneath runways and taxiways. The list of practical applications of his innovation uh, goes on and on. If you know Professor Stokey, you know that he bubbles with ideas. He's brilliant and as straight as an eye. It is simply in his blood. You cannot spend 10 minutes with him without him having a suggestion 
about some way to solve your problem. He's a very dynamic person working in a very dynamic field. This is why he stays young in appearance and young at heart. The title of his Buchanan Lecture is The Increasing Roles of Seismic Measurements in Geotechnical Engineering. Please welcome Professor Ken Stokey. Boy, if you believed all that, you are really suckers. I mean, uh, but it's very kind words. And for the first time in my life, uh, my wife is going to listen to me giving a you know, talk. I'm very nervous. Uh, um, again, very kind words. I, I think uh, much more credit than I deserve. Uh, and it is a great pleasure for me and an honor for me to give the 16th Spencer J. Buchanan Lecture here at Texas A&M University. Um, won't talk football, but I am happy it's before the football game, because huh? in the last couple of years we haven't done too well, so it would be harder for me. Um, the title is Increasing Role of Seismic Measurements in uh, Geotechnical Engineering, because say in solving, I'm going to try to really show you a bunch of case histories. Uh, a little a brief background just to, to set the stage, emphasize small strain seismic measurements, which we like to do so much. Um, and I think I remember, uh, where is Professor Murph? Would you raise your hand? Is, is he here or is he gone? Because I have heard him more than once say, sometime in the future, we're going to find a use for your measurements. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and this was in the process of maybe rejecting some offshore proposal. I'm not sure exactly what. Uh, Professor Rosette may remember better than I. Okay, but the small strain we like very much. Uh, laboratory tests that, that perform the same type of measurements. Okay, so stress wave measurements, seismic measurements, same words. It allows you to do parametric studies in the laboratory, which uh, is very helpful. Of course, the improvement will be to do those studies in the field. Present a number of examples, which I hope will be uh, interesting to you, uh, some just very briefly and some in more depth. This, to me, is one of the key of seismic measurements, and that is, again, they form a roadmap to link the field and the laboratory, one of the few roadmaps that we really have that uh, is critical uh, in sites where you have critical facilities, nuclear power plants, things like that. You're forced to do that. At other places, people may not be forced to do that, but they really should do that, in my opinion. Show you a little of that, where that fits, and then about four concluding remarks. So that's the good news. Um, background. Of course, as geotechnical engineers, we always want a boring. That's got nothing to do with seismic measurements. Huh? But we would like to know a material profile if we can get it. Um, and by the way, now that I think about it, George, don't you think between the two of us we're worth more than five points on an exam? Huh? I think you ought to up that a little bit, huh? Don't we need 10 or 15? Boy, okay, sorry. Uh, just sort of popped into my mind. Um, you know, uh, I'm not coming back for five points in the future. I'm coming back for more. Okay. <laughs> So the geotechnical engineer, then uh, the soil profile, and then the seismic testing, but to get a profile in the field of the stiffness. You're going to hear shear wave used a lot because many times we're making measurements below the water table. Shear, water doesn't support shear, so the shear wave velocity represents a material skeleton. Other times, uh, just shear waves, even though you're above the water table, because that's going to be the weakest link in the soil behavior. In compression, it's usually quite good, but in shearing, it's not. So this is a big deal. That means shear wave velocity. So there are field tests today. They're more complex than this, but that's, that would be traditional. Then in the laboratory, you would be trying to take an intact sample if you could, or a reconstituted sample if you have to. And in the laboratory, determine how the shear modulus varies with shearing strain. The shear modulus, George, I only have a couple equations. I, I think they're going to be happier with me, but I don't know. Um, uh, the small strain shear wave velocity, the shear modulus right in here, that one right there. Small strain means the maximum value, though. As you increase strain, it decreases. It's the total unit weight divided by gravity times the shear wave velocity squared. So if you talk about shear wave velocity or shear modulus in small strain measurements, they're the same. 
The laboratory also allows you to do damping measurements, which in dynamic analyses you need, and static analyses you generally don't bother with this portion. Um, and again, the nonlinearity you can determine, for instance, in the, in the laboratory. Now, the objective of the seismic measurements is, uh, although uh, George Goebel showed uh, very nice cases of measuring time, generally uh, uh, geotechnical engineering students don't do, don't do many measurements of time, but here we're going to generate some energy at a point, watch it propagate a certain distance, uh, measure the time it takes to travel that distance from which we get a shear wave velocity or a wave velocity. Uh, the key characteristic there then, of course, is that it's in the small strain. Again, that was that horizontal part of the, of the modulus uh, strain curve, and if you make a measurement at one-tenth the strain amplitude I do, it doesn't matter. If we're in the small strain, they still should, small strain region, they still should compare nicely. Um, so primarily we're measuring compression and shear waves. A compression wave and I'm speaking with compression waves, a compression wave will generate motion parallel to the directional wave propagation. George is driving the pile down with compression waves going down the pile. Uh, in soils, in the mass of the soil, it distorts the soil in a constrained compression. George had unconstrained compression. He has Young's modulus. We have constrained modulus. There's a compression wave velocity, and it's just, again, totally in weight divided by gravity times the compression wave velocity squared to get this small strain number. Shear, more complex because the particle motion is perpendicular to the directional wave propagation. What's the big deal about this? We won't need it after this slide, but it tells you how you might want to orient sensors if you are tra trying to make these measurements. Uh, again, distortion and shear, shear wave velocity and the small strain shear modulus uh, for our field measurements. Now, when you start doing deformational analyses, and uh, I very, my, very much like deformational analyses, and I think you could do uh, on foundations for this building. However, this building is performing quite well. You'd like to know maybe how much the foundations would deform under a certain load in the building, wind load on the building, and so forth. But it's in a working strain range. So when these people go to you know 10%, 20% strain, forget me, I'm out of the picture. But if you're in the working deformation range, which is probably in a range like this, the initial slope of shear stress versus shearing strain, for instance, the initial slope of that curve is the small strain shear modulus. And that's very important if you're going to do good deformational analyses to start out on the right trajectory. Huh? So here we are starting out this curve. Uh, again, then the laboratory would be giving us uh, right now the nonlinear characteristics of that curve. Okay, just general, again, general background. Testing techniques, cross hole, they drill multiple boreholes in the ground, put energy in at a point, watch it propagate known distances. Uh, this is, <laughs> depending on who you talk to, this is the gold standard. And since I get to talk now, this is the gold standard. Uh, someone else might not say that, but it's also the gold standard because it's darn expensive. So it, the, the more you can get away from drilling holes, the better off you are. So this, this usually comes in at the last resort when they've had some problems and they do have to call us uh, or someone else that's quite familiar with this type of testing. More often now is downhole testing because they're drilling one borehole, so they also get their material profile, and, and then the source is on the surface, and you make some measurements here uh, at depth, you know, at multiple points. There's a cone penetrometer has been adopted to, um, to <laughs> this is being recorded, right? Yes. Oh, this is good because I can really say, you know, they can't rebuff me right now. Um, I really suggested this, but uh, uh, to Professor Schmertman, by the way, uh, who says, oh, that's a wonderful idea. And, uh, but I was in Texas, and there's rock so close over where I am, I never really developed a penetrometer. I worked with Fugro for a while to get this started, but other people have uh, really took it forward. Okay, but it, it's very nice to have the cone penetrometer a uh, way to deliver the sensor into the soil huh, and make measurements at multiple depths. Also, anytime you can get a testing technique, 
with which you make multiple measurements, it's better than a testing technique with a single measurement. And so this has got multiple measurements because end bearing, side friction, and all the other uh, whistles and bells that are put into it these days. So that's a very good test. Well, then why don't we throw everything out? Because, and just do this, because we're doing rock, we're doing hard to sample materials, gravelly, blah, blah, blah. So this, this application of the CPT has its limitations in terms of the material that it can work with. PS suspension logger, compression shear, is a wireline tool that's down the borehole and the source is down here and there are two sensors. This is just an idealization. Uh, and you can make measurements down to great depths quite efficiently, quite cost effectively, because it's just a simple wireline tool. So it's used a lot, particularly on sites where you start going down um, 300, 500, 700, 1,000, 2,000 feet. And, and those exist in the geotechnical engineering area. We do this down to 3,000 feet as the deepest we've done it, but then, as Professor Brio had mentioned, we have a big monster up here called T-Rex that is a beautiful generator and works very well as the source. Um, you just have to have a thick wallet, but DOE does, um, and a real need, they have to have the need, and, and so that works very well also. The last one is one that uh, Professor Rosette really and I uh, put together, and you know, we were talking someday, and we, one day, and we said, golly, you know, I really had a bad time going to the doctor last week, and he was, oh, yeah, the week before, you know, they were doing bad things to me. I think we should do non-invasive testing because Mother Nature would probably like that as well, if you get my drift. Wasn't that? Oh, he, he seems to be denying it right now. Uh, but so we ended up uh, developing a non-invasive technique that we'll just call surface wave. You're going to see a certain variation. But there's more research going on around the world today in this technique than any other that I've ever seen, just because you have tremendous potential. And I'll show you quite a few applications uh, using surface wave testing. Also then in the laboratory, stress waves, seismic waves, you're, you would resonate this soil column with a torsional resonant column, torsional simple shear device. And uh, uh, Professor Zornberg uh, leaned over and said South America. So I apologize to anyone from South America that I didn't say they were using this there. I think it's not a Stokey device is why I forgot. You know, I'm not sure. It, with, uh, with that type of device, typical parametric studies would be how does, say, small strain shear modulus vary with confining pressure? In other words, if I had a uniform material, maybe how would it go up with depth? Or if I have a bunch of layers and I take samples out of the layer and I say, well, okay, the, in situ, I think it's going to be about this pressure. I'd like to uh, determine the modulus at that pressure. And at that pressure, maybe I'm going to do an earthquake analysis, so I want to uh, introduce uh, nonlinearity in there to mimic the earthquake, and I would also test at larger strains with this device. That, that's typical of the parametric studies we're talking about. This is just a little exaggerated because it's only one log cycle, and typically if you plotted over a couple log cycles, it would look much flatter. Uh, another one that has uh, been developed, and that's to go along with triaxial testing and so forth, and uh, unbeknownst to folks, I introduced this because I, someone introduced me to it. Uh, the Applied Research Lab at the University of Texas was doing work in this. They read about a young man that uh, was at school who still didn't have a full head of hair but did have a black beard, and uh, uh, came to see me and said, look, we're doing this for the Navy. And they were, they were building piezoelectric crystals and uh, the piezoelectric crystals, well, you put a voltage through and they'll bend or, or expand or contract. If you just let them sit there and you bend them, they'll put a, give a voltage out and so forth. So you can generate, here you would have a triaxial specimen and uh, vibrating here, bending here, generating a shear wave and picking it up down here, uh, expanding and contracting a disc here and picking up a compression wave there. That's just sort of what that's meant to represent. You don't need to worry about it. But uh, so I had a student start on it, and I went to NGI and made a presentation and said, uh, you know, we're doing this. And they said, one, we never published, by the way. Yes, if you need to go in the archives, I can show you. At NGI, presented this. Gianor came up to me and said, do you mind if we started doing it? And I said, wonderful. Uh, 
I think this is the only time I've said this in public, so I apologize. Uh, it's, I've been having too many cough drops and it's gone to my head. Um, okay, examples. Application and case histories. Uh, static loading conditions, dynamic loading conditions. To be honest, some of the static loading conditions that I've sort of snuck in here uh, really have a, a strong dynamic component to them. Okay, static loading conditions, site characterization, very typical. Huh? Uh, been done for decades and decades in the 40s, 50s, and so forth. Site characterization in terms of layering, groundwater table, and so forth. Um, more recently, I think, <laughs> You know, uh, the old joke was uh, the geophysicist would go out and, and prepare to do some work for a geotechnical engineer, and you know, the geotechnical engineer, okay, I need to do, 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 da, 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 and he said, well, what answer do you want? You know, and then they'd come back with that answer. That was a real serious problem, uh, at least uh, there wasn't a trust there in the 50s and 60s and uh, 70s probably. Uh, except for the simple thing. So in some of these other types of characterizations, it was a problem until engineers, and I think this is very important, engineers got involved that understood the material or were learning about the material using these techniques, and I think significant progress then occurred in the civil engineering area. Okay, and you're gonna see some underground structures, not this layering, you're gonna see some characterization of underground structures, that is, around the walls of a structure. Uh, tunnel investigation, dams and levees, I wasn't able to get an owner to release the dam stuff. Um, solid municipal waste landfills, very, um, uh, stood out for months on those, uh, but I won't show you some slides, there isn't time for all of those. But just typical, I mean, and there are many other applications. I'm sorry if there's one of your favorites that I've left out. Process monitoring, you know, grouting, ground improvement, and so forth, and movement under loading, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and Professor Briod hosted a conference here at Texas A&M Settlements 94, where some of this was, I think, nicely shown to the profession for ba basically the first time that uh, Swiger and so forth, some people did it, but, but it really brought it to, uh, to the forefront of a lot of people's attention uh, back then. Here's what we're looking at then in, in many of these static approaches, the general idea. You might want to look at the material. Do I have good material down there? Will it perform the function I want? Well, you could look at the shear wave velocity, same thing as shear modulus here, you know, just squared, uh, versus depth. And maybe you would have a profile like this, let's say, that yellow line, that's the field case. And and for good material, we would think maybe something like that. So, of course, we have to have this, an idea of what that represents. This would be a crust, uh, for instance, could be lightly cemented material, whatever. This would be the problem that we're probably looking for. And, and I'm gonna show you a couple examples where this problem goes right to the surface, and then the, the question is how deep is that? And then, hey, here's the good material, great. I can move forward with my design and, and solve the problem. In another one, maybe change conditions. This could be, this would be very typical of dynamic compaction where you're dropping a big weight, compacting a granular material, and you've got some before readings, and then you have some after, and that's a zone where improvement was, has occurred, but mainly it's in this general area that you have improved the material. Now, is this improvement enough for the loading and, and situation that's gonna be there? This would also be very much for, uh, 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 liquefaction studies and, and so in earthquakes, but I'm sneaking it in also under static. So here's a tunnel. This is a tunnel in Washington, D.C. It's in rock. They bored the tunnel and then it was going to be a water tunnel. They, they cast a, a concrete liner, uh, had to grout the top because, of course, when you're casting it, you can't really pressure it to get it in tight contact, so there's grouting there. And a big, well, when they pressurized it, it failed. Not good. The first test, huh? It's a little bit like building a dam and fill up the reservoir and the dam fails. This isn't good. Uh, so, of course, it's a big lawsuit. And uh, we were asked to help, uh, happy to do it. Um, my wife was happy to have me do it as well. Oh, excuse me, sweetie. Uh, you know, there's, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, when you start working on a $200 million project, you can be in the noise level and everyone's still happy. Uh, so here we are testing along the, the tunnel wall, testing near the crown. I just want to show you one result, but 
this was very successful. Um, I'm told when we were done, uh, we were working with George Sowers and so forth, told when we were done, uh, the lawsuit went from 200 million to 20 million, but I don't know that for a fact. Huh? But the contractor wasn't at fault. Here we are tapping on the, on the tunnel. Uh, the beard was blacker then. You're gonna find that I'm probably only good for hitting with hammers. Uh, I, uh, I'm not good for much else, but that's okay. So you're making measurements along the tunnel wall, and you're looking back behind it, so that's a spring line that you're gonna see. You're looking on that horizontal plane back behind the wall that you're tapping on, so very beneficial. Here we go. So here's one velocity material, then it jumps up, and, and you're gonna get, you know, it won't, it won't necessarily be that uh, precise a transition, but you get, and then here's the other material. And you can see that that's like 2,500 feet, uh, 2,500 meters per second, say 8,000 feet per second or whatever, great concrete. That's good concrete. Contractor didn't screw up on the concrete. Um, you see that it, given this situation now, you've got a, a thickness that's about a foot, 0.3 meters. That's what it was supposed to be. Uh, and in this case, you would have some trouble in here. There are no voids. You just have to take my word for that and that the rock in this case is stiffer than the concrete. Uh, would work very well. Um, and you'll have other places where the rock was softer and so forth and so on, but it answered all of the questions. But all you were looking for is a general profile of stiffness of the material and how that compared with high quality materials. Very easily solved. Here's another one. This is a waste isolation pilot project. Low level radioactive waste is gonna be stored there. That's in a salt layer down, you know, and I forget now how deep it was, 500, 700 feet or something like that in uh, northeast uh, New Mexico. And in this case, we're using a borehole method to look at this salt, and, the, and we did surface waves as well uh, on it, on the wall, and the question was, how far back has this uh, excavation process, this construction process, Disturb the salt about that far. It would be very hard to detect. Now, the que also question is, well, what about the free field? How stiff was it? Well, we couldn't get out into the free field, but get, based on what we found, it, it didn't matter to them. It still would spall off from time to time, so you had to, because of the high stresses, right near the surface, it would come off, and they had to keep cleaning it off. But the disturbed zone back behind there was negligible. Uh, here's another, uh, again, see, here's a hammer. Uh, here's another shaft. This is a mine shaft near Cleveland, Ohio, for uh, Professor Goebel. Uh, and this, this was an old mine that they were gonna now use as a pneumatic storage area. In other words, they were gonna pump air down into it at higher pressures and when they didn't need energy, and then they were gonna let it out with generators up above when they did need energy. This was a concept. But the mine was old, and they had to figure out how far, particularly in several of the shafts, how far back the rock had deteriorated. And it turns out it's about this much. It was very easy again, just profiles, like I said, you can go in there and quickly do many sites around there in a short period of time. Processes, okay, so th uh, those were an idea of site characterization. Process monitoring. This is a field trial of blast densification. I stress field trial. Uh, and uh, we were doing surface waves on the surface here, looking down into uh, the profile and down in the range of like 7 to 11 meters, 7 to 12 meters, is a loose sand zone that they were worried about, so this really is a liquefaction problem, but they were worried about that loose sand liquefying during a major earthquake in the South Carolina, this is in South Carolina area, and the, so they wanted to see, well, can we densify this material with a certain uh, set of blasting? Now, you know, of course, that um, this could be dangerous. So uh, once I went there and helped get everything underway, I left the graduate students there to run the tests huh? and came back a week later. But I wanted to make sure that they took pictures. This is Jim Bay that took these pictures, for those of you who might know. Here's time zero, they're setting off the blast. So okay, two seconds later, that looks pretty good to me. Um, 
Ooh, three seconds later, what the hell, sorry, happened. Uh, you know, things are flying up and uh, every which way. And I mean, here's a casing coming down and things are going up. Well, it turned out that their consultant here, who's a very famous gentleman who did a first rate job, wasn't consulted. So these people went off and did it on their own and they put in too much explosives. Because here's before the blast, here's one day after the blast, this is all we need to look at. Did, did the test plan work? No. I mean, it loosened the material. Now, you can't, you have to be careful because they say, wait, 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 it's gonna come back with time. Okay, I have time, you know why I have time? Why do I have time, men? I have graduate students. <laughs> no problem. Okay, uh, next year you're to go over there and run tests before you graduate. All righty, here we go. Ten months later, after the blasting, I want you to graduate early. Uh, ten months after the blasting, here's what's happened. Yes, it did regain some, but it didn't even come back to what it was before. Just a very good example of how this was readily done. I showed you one, we probably did 30 around the site. They all were looking like this. Here's a very recent one that uh, uh, is at a, the proposed location of a potential nuclear power plant. This is near Augusta, Georgia. And uh, they, they were building a test field. This, is a, <laughs> this really is a very easy problem to solve. And we knew the answer before we did it, but on a, on a critical facility like this, you have to prove it. It's not like you can just say, well, this is so. You're gonna have to show how it works. And so this test field was built. It's basically a silty sand that they were placing, non-plastic. Of course, they were placing it in eight inch layers, compacting it to like 98, 99, 100% modified proctor, taking plenty of density tests and everything. But you can't get away with uh, blow count anymore. You can't, even with cone penetrometer, from an earthquake analysis point of view, you also have to know how this material will behave during an earthquake. You have to measure its shear wave velocity. So, at least for, depending on what reviewers are asking the questions. Uh, so that was needed, that question was asked in advance, by the way, so they knew they were gonna be facing it. And they were happy to address it. Uh, but we came in at four different times and made measurements on this fill during the construction. It's only a 20 foot thick fill. We were supposed to come in like every five feet and you know, working with a contractor from distance and so forth. It doesn't work out perfectly that way, but it's not bad. So here's five feet of fill. Here are uh, six sites that we measured. There were really seven, just showing you six. The seventh is just exactly like these. And in the, with the surface waves, you, the, this is just a piecewise representation, and that's you, assuming uniform shear wave velocity layers. This is what the shear wave velocity profile would be in the material that was compacted, and then in the underlying, underlying material, just to give us a start, huh? It would even have been nice to do before, but that was just sort of frosting on the cake and not really necessary. So we came in after, let's say, five feet. Then after 10 feet, so this is the first and the second visit, and there's maybe a week or two in between, and here's the second visit. Now, uh, when you saw that on a log-log scale, if I hope I pointed it out, on how shear modulus changed, and it was basically, you know, a couple straight lines, and the second straight line is normally consolidated, the first one's over-consolidated state, it would give you a parabolic relationship in the normally consolidated state or a parabolic relationship in the over-consolidated, just a slightly different slope. And that's how come this line's put through there. It's not meant to be parabolic, it's just a, a best fit, and lo and behold, you know, that came right out of the data, you saw that. Okay, here are, so there's the first layer that we tested, the first stage, the second stage, the third stage, the fourth stage. There's the shear wave velocity profile now to make it a little easier to see, not to try to fool you. Uh, here's the best fit curve, more or less by eye, so let me just uh, be careful there. The second one, by the way, there was rain between the first and the second right before we got there. Uh, the third one and the fourth one. And what you see is, let's, let's take a look over here. Here's the first one, and then here's the fourth one. So this is a start, that's the end. And that's how much that stiffness increased because of compaction from this layer, probably not that or that, but compaction there, still doing, getting some energy down in this layer, and the weight of that layer, then the weight of this layer, and then the weight of that layer, got it to go from here to here, okay? Now, 
the structural engineer wanted, <laughs> wrote a specification that has to have at least a sure wave velocity at 1,000 feet per second, blah, blah, blah. Well, yes, here it is down here at 1,000 feet. I don't know if it looks very obvious. It's 17, 16, 17, 18 feet. So it will meet that because when the nuclear island is built that would be built on this fill, it will have a stress level higher than this if you had this 15 feet of fill on top of it. So the velocity is going to go up to the proper number. Now the question also is, well, can the laboratory test, because you, 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 uh, when you're building something like this, you go to borrow areas, try to find the material, bring it in. Okay, will the borrow material fit this? Huh? Okay, here's the borrow material. In fact, it was taken from the density test at the, at the site. But here are the resonant column tests of what would happen here. That's, that's laboratory data translated to the field, given the state of stress, the unit weight, and so forth. There it is. There are some assumptions there. Don't worry about those. They're not a big deal. Uh, as long as you pay a very expensive consultant, it's not a problem at all. Huh? Just teasing. Um, this went through the University of Texas. Uh, so here is the, the state of stress, that what the shear wave velocity would be under that state of stress. Here's a comparison with what we measured. Yes. It all fits together. Yes, you can do it. Does that mean you shouldn't be doing testing once it's built? No, you're going to do some testing because what's our uh, paramount uh, uh, canon that we have to be careful of? We have to take care of public safety, huh? protect the public. So we are going to have to make these measurements when we build it as well. But it says, yeah, it all fits together. It passed the nuclear, um, uh, the nuclear panel evaluation. So they're going. Other, I indicated to you other ones, this is in Taiwan, and this was uh, going to be a liquefaction problem uh, and dynamic compaction, and I just, uh, sorry I just didn't prepare all the data. You won't be sorry when you see when I finish, huh? but uh, it, not all the profiles for all of these, but it works very well here in dynamic compaction. Um, Giovanna, do you recognize this? You can, you'll get me back at some time in the future, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, that's Voltalina landslide. So the, this, the material came down the mountain, went through the valley. Really, they knew it was happening. It, be, it was because of rain, so they saw it happening. They cleared everyone out. Someone still died, but they, that was, you know, a, a real mistake. It, they, they knew they were not supposed to be there. Came down and went back up and then came down the valley. And the question is, is this dense? And the answer is yes. So we were testing around here. Does it make sense? My goodness, think of the energy that nature put into this. In fact, in China, I told, we were in China shortly after the earthquake in May, and I was talking to the Chinese. I said, now, wait a minute. You need to think about what you have here. You have a billion dollars worth of fill in multiple places that build earthquake lakes. This fill, I'm sure, is dense, but you can go check it. Now, why don't you turn it into a dam? They were so busy, to be honest, they couldn't think about that at the time. But, you know, I think, wow, this is a great idea. The Japanese say, Professor Ashar, we, we've done that already. You know, there's never a new idea, it seems. But, yeah, that, the, you can, you, you'll find when you start testing these things. Now, remember, you got stuff the size of a house in there that's a boulder. This is not easy stuff to test. Um, in fact, one of the most exciting things... I, <laughs> Aye, aye, aye. Uh, and I've been to sensitivity training a couple times. I'm about to get in trouble. Uh, one of the most exciting things I've ever done, except for my honeymoon. Oh my gosh. Um, can we erase that from the. Okay. Uh, was uh, Mount St. Helens. Uh, and about in 1980, this is process monitoring again. We had to be flown in. Well, <laughs> there were a bunch of Vietnam pilots who were flying the helicopters, and they took us right inside the crater. That was the really exciting thing. This wasn't near as exciting. But they, they would fly the equipment in, and the question is, several natural dams occurred be, from this eruption, created several lakes. Are these natural dams uh, dense? Can you trust them in the short term, at least? They were going to drain, but can you trust them in the short term? Or if an earthquake occurred, could, could they liquefy and, or be breached and uh, uh, 
uh, release uh, tremendous sediment and water down the river, and there was a nuclear power plant. It was, turned out it was upstream a little bit, but everything went upstream as well from, the, from Mount St. Helens. And the answer is yes and no. In other words, in some places the answer was yes, other places, one or two places the answer was no. So it was a fairly critical situation. Now when you're out there testing, there's steam coming out of the ground. There's hot stuff down there uh, some of the time. And this was, this was uh, uh, at least uh, six or nine months after the eruption, but it was, uh, it was spectacular. Um, predicting movements. So this is Professor Briode, uh, and uh, I, I think maybe you instilled this in me. Uh, we've, been, we've been looking a bit. This won't be the best case history, but it, it was where we were at at the time, so I, I apologize maybe ahead of time for, for a little uh, short-sightedness on some of this testing, but let me just say, loading footings, I'm uh, going to show you one in, in the Austin area, loading footings, getting a load settlement uh, relationship for that. However, of course, if we get involved, we're making seismic measurements here under the footing or of the material before we put a load on it. This is a non-plastic silt, uh, N160 from the standard penetration test, 16, shear wave velocity 190 meters per second. This is lightly cemented. This is lightly cemented. Very important point, in my opinion. Okay, have telltales and, and so forth in terms of looking at the footing movements at depth. The short-sightedness here, two things, and you can blame the supervisor uh, for that, and that is we were in a quarry, and it was when the quarry was about to close for various reasons, and they were just working around the clock, it was so noisy. So that raw data was, you know, it was pretty rough because there were huge trucks going by us. We were not in the path of the trucks. We were off, we were on natural soil, but they, it was, we could not get away from the noise. But you can see the load unload curve. The other bad part there is I didn't have them take it far enough. However, uh, this, is, this is like a factor of safety of three when you go through a tip, uh, typical analysis, huh, using blow count. And so you, you aren't that far off, I think. Uh, in, in terms of settlement. Here's the settlement, 15 thousandths. Let's say 1.5 hundredths of an inch, huh? It's tiny. Uh, things were working well. What you find is if you try to predict that settlement, here are our comparisons, this, here are the field measurements, and you know, we had uh, uh, telltales in the deposit, so there's the, the settlement, that's what I just reported about 0.015 inches, and here's what you'd get with blow count, converting it to moduli, following Schmertman's approach, here's Schmertman's approach right here. Now, you might say, well, it's less than an inch and we're fine, but you know, it would be nice to be closer. This really is, if you start putting the proper moduli in here, and an example is, let's take exactly Schmertman's method, but now let's put in the seismic moduli. Not going from blow count to moduli, let's put in the seismic moduli. There we are. Why don't we get rid of this right now and take a closer look at that, huh? So here are the field measurements. Uh, here are the, the relative movements beneath the footing using a plaque, using a, uh, Schmertman's method and the seismic moduli that we measured. And this is a plaxis analysis, which really didn't get into the nonlinear because of the cemented and because we didn't go to high enough loads, that's my fault, uh, right here. The point being of all of this, if you'll get past, hey, Professor Stokey sort of screwed up the tests. If you get past that, these, this, this would predict the movement at any load. You're gonna put in the nonlinearity of the soil you're going to put it in a finite element model, finite element model, and it'll predict the nonlinearity or the settlement at any load level, not some effective uh, settlement and so forth, not uh, about one inch. And so I think there's an enormous future in there. But it was started uh, uh, in '94, at least, where it really came uh, to me to be visible, and we will continue to do a lot of work in that area. Okay, dynamic loading conditions. I, a lot of this seismic testing from an engineering point of view, really started out with machine foundations and uh, Professor Richard and so forth at the University of Michigan, who was uh, just an outstanding person. Um, 
and then it's carried along in various dynamic analyses that might be with uh, small level, small strain, but vibration problems. Earthquake engineering is where it has really taken off, of course, because of the critical need there. It, it's critical here too, but uh, there's a lot more money typically associated with the earthquake engineering. And again, I didn't show you the link between the field and the lab, but I'm about to do that. Okay, this is gonna be one application. It's in the Los Angeles area. It's because of the 1994 Northridge earthquake that we investigated this site with a group of other uh, universities and uh, consultants. So it really was a joint effort. But let's just say, here we go, um, and that is we have some excitation in the bedrock. Uh, <laughs> This is California bedrock. They don't really know what rock is. But this is pretty soft. Uh, but we'll call it bedrock. And then here we go through the soil layers, and we're getting up to the surface. There is the um, acceleration at the surface, and that's what you'd like to predict. So we'll, uh, they'll, they'll have the source, the path, and then the site, and you're going to have some input here. Now you've got to take it through those soil layers, and you've got to know the linear and nonlinear properties of that material. For the site you're going to see, we're going to be down about at this point in, uh, in the whole soil layer, uh, right around in here. I don't know where the water table is. That doesn't, it wasn't meant to be correct there. But this would be like the excitation during maybe the, the main cycle or two of motion in the earthquake. Just that, it looks quite linear to you, but that's just because of the scale. But the scale was chosen because this would be the soil near the surface, and that would be the nonlinearity that you see, certainly much softer, it's a softer material anyway, but much softer compared to the rock, and a lot more damping, so much more nonlinearity there. Uh, the site, La Cienega Overpass, 1994 Northridge earthquake, you see a deep soil deposit, 1,000 feet, 300 meters, and the peak shearing strains in the deposit were basically less than 0.2%. This is part of a resolution of site response issues in the Northridge earthquake project, and as I say, involved a lot of different groups, uh, which is a lot of fun to work with when you get the opportunity to do that. And here's the Santa Monica Freeway. There's the La Cienega Interchange. There's the Pacific Ocean, um, and that's the spaghetti of uh, Los Angeles. Here is the bridge, and of course, it had to be torn down. It, it was uh, truly devastated. Uh, here is the profile. Now, let me emphasize, this is in the free field. Strains right next to the structure, so when you have that, those drilled shafts, they're moving back and forth, the soil's not moving in phase. Yeah, the strains are enormous. Okay, I'll leave that to some other folks. This is uh, after, so this is Dr. Silva from Pacific Engineering. This is after he got uh, supposedly the proper in situ shear wave velocity measurements evaluated, which we didn't do that part. And we did a lot of the lab testing and the nonlinearities. This is a strain that he's predicting. So there's the mean and there's uh, the mean plus sigma. And it isn't getting up to point 0.2 if we go with, you know, uh, the mean plus sigma. But it's in fact fairly small, uh, you would say. I mean, uh, I know, you know, when I first got to Texas, just like uh, Professor Murph, Professor Olson said, you know, someday we'll find out what to do with your measurements as well. I think, uh, uh, I may be paraphrasing some of the things, but I'm usually polite, <laughs> okay, uh, if you get my drift. Um, okay, so here is the profile uh, of strain. And, you know, in problems like this, I don't care what the stress is. I, I don't care at all. I can tell you how things are going to behave based on the strain that's generated. It's strain that matters. It's strain that matters in pavements. It's strain that matters around the footings. But they typically, you typically don't like to make those evaluations because you're used to dealing with strength and in my near failure and stuff, pff, you can't do anything with strain. You have to have moduli and the nonlinearity to do good predictions of strain. Okay, so I st think we have a growing area. Um, I'm going to show you some results from right down here, and by the way, to get the two and a half points that I get credit for, George gets two and a half points too, but to get the two and a half points that I get credit for, uh, you're going to have to answer two questions, so one and a, half, one and a quarter points each. Uh, two questions, the first one's coming up here in a moment. Again, our part was to do nonlinear testing. This is unconfined. That's a torsional motor on the top. It's free at the top. 
The, that magnet is attached to the drive plate, but there are drive coils around there, and they don't contact each other. So that's called a freeze system up there fixed at the base. Uh, the data from the curve has been left out, so there'd be data points along here. But I want to just compare things. So here is a nonlinearity for this sample. It's a silty sand from 185 meters confined at a mean effective stress of 25 atmospheres, which is meant to mimic as best we could do uh, in terms of making approximations, lateral uh, earth pressure coefficient at rest and so forth. This is what the lab curve would predict. That's what the earthquake, you know, again, getting those strains in there. This is what the earthquake range is more or less predicted. So you see there's not too much nonlinearity. Now, is this the curve you're going to use in your analysis? I got my lab tests. It, this is going to be a partial credit question. Okay, I think I heard no. Probably from the University of Texas folks that just heard this lecture about a week ago. Okay, but at any rate, they have some inside information. Um, okay, where's the field value going to be? So we're going to do small strain. Very good, I heard an up. So here's the, there's the field shear wave velocity, translated to, converted to modulus. There's the lab. That's basically a factor of two, by the way. I think these numbers are wrong, and I have to get you the proper numbers. But uh, there's a factor of two. So what are you going to do? What's done in earthquake engineering, at least one of the things that's done, there can be vari variations of this. This is, I told you, a factor two. You're going to take this curve, you're going to multiply it by two. There it is. And that's what you're going to estimate as the in situ behavior. You could not do it without field measurements. That's done everywhere at critical sites. You can't get away without having these type of measurements anymore. Okay, so that's very nice. Uh, now, I said that we're going to try to tie in the field in the lab, and that's what this is. So, and this goes for all analyses, and you could say impact to sample disturbance and so forth on these curves. Uh, for earthquake engineering, you could say G log gamma, so that nonlinearity. For stress strain curves, we could have shearing stress, shearing strain. Uh, for me, I just want to try to emphasize to you the overwhelming need for these measurements and uh, it, whether you have nonlinear static or dynamic analyses. And the key you just saw there, you could do the field in the lab. Okay, so what's he going to say? Well, we have a bunch of data from that. We have more data than this, but from that Rosrin project, a uh, bunch of sites were done. And that's what you see here. What the heck? Uh, we tried to see what, what type, what would be the best correlator between this disturbance factor, and the disturbance factor is going to be right here, and that's going to be the shear wave velocity in the lab divided by the shear wave velocity in the field. I hope you can see that. So lab over field. And you see it starts out at one and goes down, gets smaller. Hmm? And on the horizontal axis here, you see the in situ shear wave velocity. Depth wasn't the correlator. The, the most robust correlator was how stiff the soil, and this says soil up there because I'm going to show you some rock, how stiff the soil was in situ. And by the way, when you get out here, the difference between soil and rock is, is truly uh, uh, blurred, um, and that's a whole other topic. But what you see is as the in situ shear wave velocity goes up, so as the stiffness of the material goes up, you get more and more disturbance. Now, this is just meant to be a general trend because each one of these adjustments would be done independently at the site. Huh? But you'll see the trend of that decreasing. Now, what you see here is in the previous one, in this, this factor of two, so that's a factor of two, that means we have uh, a 40% change, square root of two, because it's velocity squared. So in the terms of the shear wave velocity, the shear wave velocity of this, uh, the estimated in, in situ, sorry, for the estimated field curve is 40% above, square root of 2, 1.414, so uh, this value in looking at that. So right in here is about where that value was, um, and that 40% is, this gives this ratio, so the 1.4, 1 over 1 1.4, uh, I hope this is easy to follow, is 0.7. Mm -hmm. So here we are, right in here someplace, for that, for that sample. And if you didn't have your in-situ numbers, but you had this graph, you could say, well, it's going to go from about 90% to about 50% or something like that. But I don't know where I'm going to be. 
What that translates to is here's shear modulus versus shearing strain. There's the lab curve. Sorry, I left out the dash parts here. But that's just basically where the lab curve would be. That's the field curve we showed you. And this is where you would be if you had no in situ shear wave velocity, but knew a lot. But knew a lot. That's, uh, you know, remember I indicated you got to get the trajectory right at the start of the curve. I mean, you're going all over the place here. Who knows where you're going to end up at higher strains? So I hope I'm leaving the point that it's a very important measurement to make. And, uh, and, and in fact, some of the earlier work that you saw was just static characterization. We didn't make any measurements like this. We just used the in situ numbers directly. Huh? This is what the stress strain curve would be. So a G log gamma curve is nothing more than a stress strain curve because there's, if I know, uh, I don't know the stress in my G log gamma, but I know G, I know gamma, so I can calculate stress, and there's what it would look like, that same uh, relationship in terms of shearing stress versus shearing strain. I, there's a little I've, I've exaggerated, which probably I have a lot in this lecture, but uh, I'll admit to it right here and that is I probably shouldn't have gone to quite as large as strains right now because other things begin to, to play into uh, the, the stress strain curve, changes in volume, poor pressure generation, things like that that are not accounted for here. So we have to be careful. Okay, um, I think this is the last, uh, hang in there please, this is the last dynamic, this is the last application. Here's a dynamic application, this is the Yucca Mountain site. You know, it's designated as the first permanent geologic repository for high-level radioactive waste, and my sensitivity training now does, does kick in. Uh, I don't know what the new administration will do, and so I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but uh, everything I've seen, people are doing a very fine job. Okay, DOE has been studying this for quite a few years. Let's just leave it that way in case some DOE person sees this film. Um, and the University of Texas, we've been very fortunate to be involved in, in various aspects here on top of the mountain, really around the mountain area, in exploratory tunnels where the surface facilities will be. And you know that uh, here's the state of Nevada. Everybody knows Las Vegas. The Nevada test site is here. Uh, the Nevada test site, uh, about 100 miles uh, northwest and Yucca Mountain is in Area 25. I won't make a joke this time about Area 51, but I always enjoy the area. That's how come Area 25 is there. We're not in Area 51. I wouldn't be back here probably if we were in Area 51. Uh, lethal force authorized. We can shoot you. Okay. Um, so here's Yucca Mountain. This is a picture about five miles away. It's about seven miles long. Uh, this is uh, another picture taken over here. Uh, the North Portal facilities, which was shown as a waste handling building in the previous slide, is right here. That's that point. It's just a couple thousand feet behind the sign. There's the top of Yucca Mountain, so here's that right there. And then exploratory tunnels that are in there. And I'm just going to show you some testing right in this area to characterize the mountain. You probably know uh, it's, uh, it's tufts. Uh, they're 10 to 12 million years old, more or less, and uh, there are faults there that are quite inactive, uh, at least uh, right around the areas where we can, where others, I haven't, where others have done dating and so forth. And those uh, are just the horizontal layers from the different eruptions and the different tufts and a given eruption versus time on what, what is ejected. Okay, this is an aerial photograph that, uh, that is out there on uh, the Yucca Mountain. The picture was taken right here that had the sign and said, okay, here's a waste handling building at the top of the mountain, the exploratory uh, tunnel. Here's exploratory tunnel that goes in, starts here, north ramp, around, south ramp. Here's another drift that goes across. There is the top of the mountain. Uh, now the mountain has ended here and we're in another area over here. But I hope you can see those uh, sort of inclined lines and those would be the drifts where the high-level radioactive waste will be stored uh, when, if, if and when the facility is built. Uh, and I would just like to show you in the footprint some testing that we've done uh, with uh, 
uh, some new equipment, some old equipment, and it's lasted over a few years, so some old equipment and some new equipment. This is T-Rex, sorry, this is Liquidator, it's not T-Rex. Uh, this is a little heavier than T-Rex, but T-Rex can shake in multiple directions. This is mainly shaking vertically. This is on the top of Yucca Mountain, and it's used to generate um, uh, surface waves it, when we're profiling quite deeply. It's been used at, at many uh, sites around the country, or a few, a few uh, critical sites where profiling was needed, uh, and you just couldn't drill all the boreholes. It wasn't cost effective. So there's liquidator down there. It'll get to another point where you can't even see it, and it's generating 1,000 meter long waves and I think just for the students from Texas, Minjay, is that you right there? I think so. That's a gentleman in the audience. He, that, this was taken in 1995, and we think he's gonna graduate soon. <laughs> well, I just lost everybody coming over to Texas, didn't I? Uh, that's the end of that. Well, just don't study with Professor Stokey, and we're okay. Uh, okay, so here are shear wave velocity versus depth, and all the profiles, there are 19 profiles. L uh, liquidator was only used to do about 12 or something here. Uh, this is over quite a long time, I mean multiple years, because you just go there for a short time, analyze data, and go back later when the more data is needed. But you can see the number of profiles and how they differ with depth, how it decreases with depth. So this was an old machine and blah, blah, blah. And you can also see the COV, okay? That's the standard deviation here. So there's a median, there's a plus or 16th and 84th percentile. Basically, uh, we're looking at the standard deviation divided by the mean. And what you see near the surface, you always have a lot of variability. As you get down a ways, you get into quite a uniform material. Uh, maybe surprisingly, maybe not to you but it's uh, quite uniform, the COV is less than 0.2, and then you start seeing it jump up to 0.3. If you look at all of these profiles, you probably are identifying, well, wait a minute, there's a, quite a stiff layer that seems to be in this region, and there are other profiles down here that don't have that stiff region, and that's the reason for that high COV. If you take those out, this, and you divide it into two different uh, profiles, which is done in the analysis, I'm just not gonna do it here in public, uh, you will find that uh, the COV drops way down. But these are profiles that were collected. It took longer to analyze, but here's a profile down, you know, several, down uh, 1,500 feet in one day. You just, you know, you're talking rock. You can't drill uh, for the cost that you can do this. So you're, you're getting the capability now. If you have 100 footings at a site, you can come out, go out there and test every footing site to try to look at the variability around. Where are the soft spots and so forth? I think in the future, you'll be able to do things like that because now you're just, you'd be a point up here if it's more shallow foundations, let's say on sand, for instance. You, you have the capabilities of, I think, really um, uh, profiling uh, complete sites. Okay, but that's just an example. Remember, you got already the, out of the two and a half points, you got one and a quarter already. Now. Here again are resonant column tests on a sample, and I didn't point it out the repository by and large, it's not always, but it's, it's gonna vary in depths over this range, and so we're, we took a sample from about 1,000 feet. Huh? Remember, the mountain's going down, I mean, it's, it, the elevation is decreasing, so the repository looks like, relative to these all plotted at zero, looks like it's coming up there in that. But we'll look at one sample down here about 1,000 feet, there it is. Um, and that's a rock core, as I say, about 1,000 feet. Uh, it's not, the confinement isn't proper for 1,000 feet, but it's as high as we could go, that's 31 atmospheres. And this material is not showing any pressure dependency, so it doesn't matter after that. Now, where is the field measurement? One, two, three. This, these, this is a bright crowd. This is a good crowd. Okay, why did you say that? Huh? So you got two and a half points. I don't know about George's test. He had a lot of equations. Uh, but uh, yes, if you start looking at core, core from a job like this, and you were to scratch the core out here, it wouldn't happen but about a few hundred feet. I mean, it covers rooms like this. 
But if you stretch the core out, you see, ah, there's some good core. Ooh, this isn't very good. Ah, there's some good stuff. Oh, this is pretty fractured and so forth. I can't test that. Okay, so automatically, I'm biased. I have to test the good stuff. And in testing the good stuff, you are very biased towards the really good material. In fact, probably out here, you maybe need to do some other things, huh? because the movement along cracks and so forth aren't taken into account necessarily. So you have, this is a critical, again now, a critical number. Um, you might say, well, how come you're doing tests on a rock and, you know, want to remain linear? Well, they, there are some extreme design conditions where it may get to be nonlinear, but for much of it, it's going to be in here. It's true. I've been asking for the strain profile that they're predicting and, and haven't got it yet, but uh, it's one thing you need because strain will tell us how well we were doing in, in that evaluation. Now, there's the curve that would be used in the analysis of an earthquake going up through that rock column, going around the, the repository level, and uh, it's uh, very important how uh, the tunnels move and how the canisters that will be stored down there move and so forth and so on. This is, that's what's used in design. I said four points and I exaggerated three. Okay, I hope you will see from this, if you didn't already have a, a pretty good idea, but seismic measurements play an important role in geotechnical engineering. I, that role is only going to increase. Uh, the role will continue to grow in solving static and dynamic problems for a simple reason. These are all non-destructive tests, you know, that we've been doing. You cannot test the nation's infrastructure destructively. You have to do two- and three-dimensional profilings, I think, uh, and monitor versus time, so a fourth dimension, uh, on, on what is happening, and that takes stress wave measurements. Uh, so I, I hope that's a good argument uh, that, that you buy into, because it's correct. Um, the growth is going to involve four areas. Education. We need to introduce these ideas sooner. Um, I think it, it, in the senior, you know, it's like a senior elective or something, just some simple aspects. Uh, certainly in graduate school, for those that might be working in these areas, that's not for everybody. Um, and so we're trying to do this. We're not very good at this. Integration means putting multiple testing techniques together. So, and I've only been you, showing you stress wave measurements. There are, you know, ground probing radar, there are radar, there are electromagnetic, there are a whole suite of geophysical measurements that the geophysicists aren't really applying by and large the way we need it done. Huh? This is a mechanical property that you see. That's the start of the stress strain curve, the initial slope. Uh, that, that's easy for engineers to, to grasp. Uh, some of the other ones are, are uh, maybe not quite as easy at times to see how they fit in. But it's integration of geophysical and other uh, engineering tests that need to be done combined with stress waves. Automation, we are not, uh, I haven't concentrated on that at all uh, with students and so forth, but that really needs to be done so that the so that more practicing engineers can really apply this in a, in a rapid fashion. And there's work going on in this area right now. And then, you know, this means I don't know what's coming. I'm sure you guys are going to come up with some good ideas. You're going to innovate. You're going to add to this. Um, you're going to take it in directions that we haven't ever thought of. And I look forward to seeing, I hope I get to see some of your innovations. Um, I want to thank the Professor Briode and the faculty here at Texas A&M University, uh, who I have some very good friends over here. We, again, just probably don't talk too much during football. Oh, so Thanksgiving, I'm not calling Professor Rosette, for instance. Um, I have good friends over here and really enjoy coming over here. Uh, it's been a true pleasure for me to give this 16th Buchanan lecture. Of course, there are a lot of deep pockets here that had to help with some of this stuff that's very expensive. And uh, to be honest, you know, there are so many graduate students uh, that have been a joy to interact with, some that are here in the audience right now and uh, former ones that we have out there. Just like uh, the faculty at Texas A&M, we're very proud of our 
present students and very proud of our uh, graduates uh, that are out there working in the field. And uh, you bring a lot of honor to the state of Texas. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, you showed four matters of uh, field measurements for uh, PR web analysis. Uh, my question is about the size of the matter. Uh, as compared to your gold standard on cross cell method, how do you deal with that matter? Because I think the size of the strain rate is significantly higher than the other matters. So, in terms of the G value, how close we are at the small strain levels? Okay. This is, this is uh, there's more to the question maybe than you might uh, think. Um, I don't know that the strain amplitude, now it's not while you're pushing it, it's sitting there. And basically what you're doing is you're taking, making a measurement at a point, then another point and another point. You're, you're looking at those times and you're putting some line through them to give average velocities of the layers, huh? dividing into some layers. And so if you have some problems around the cone, I mean, you've got a disturb zone, blah, 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 all that, that will pretty much cancel out, okay? So those things don't matter. Now, on a site-by-site -site basis, and there's a paper in there that talks about that variability and a comparison, it happens to be between downhole and uh, surface wave tests, but on a site-by-site -site basis, and we've done quite a few blind comparisons, that means you have to turn the data into the client, then the other people, because at some of these very, you know, at Yucca Mound, Hanford, places like that, you do multiple testing techniques, they get turned in, then you learn what has happened. When you do things like that, you find that those mean or median profiles, they're gonna be about the same, by the way, but if you have enough sites, four, five, six, seven, depending upon the variability that's out there, you wanna keep with the same basic parent material, that on the median values will be very close. Now, we haven't done it with the seismic cone penetrometer, but we've done it with the downhole, the suspension logger, and surface wave tests. Uh, however, you give one given site and you're going to get differences. The differences could be 10, 15, 20 percent even over some of, the, uh, some of the profile. Why? That's because of the spatial variability that's out there and different techniques sampling different amounts. Huh? So surface wave sampling a lot, uh, the cone, uh, you know, the downhole much less, the PS suspension log are really localized, and that, but when you can get that out by using a bunch of sites of the same basic material, you're going to find that COVs and so forth can be even below 0.1. We've found that at sites, huh? It really surprises people. But that's on, you know, like on a mean curve, and, uh, and you get some variability. And even for a site where it could be 0.15 uh, COV, uh, there will be differences between the different techniques just because of uh, the spatial variability out there. Uh, I have a follow-up. That COV is on the uh, shape of the cone, yeah, you're right, you're right. When, but typically what happens when people look at that, they're looking at the COV on the shear wave velocity and it'll be based, it's going to be twice because it's a small number, so when you square it, it turns out to be, you know, just if it's 10% on velocity, it's 20% on modulus, basically. We're not going to talk about 100%. If you, you know, if you have variability, it gives you a COV of 0.3 or 0.4, you're mixing, <laughs> you're mixing a, a soft rock with, a, with a, a, a very soft soil or something like that. You, the problem that you have there, and that's where it's a nice indicator, it says, wait a minute, you've got different materials here. You shouldn't mix these all up in a pot and come up with some mean because the mean doesn't represent anything that's out there. You have to subdivide these into different locations with particular characteristics, then look at the variability of those and design accordingly for each one of these different locations. It's a big, big discussion that I have with seismologists these days. I have a question. You showed that uh, in the field you get one point. Can you not sweep the vibration amplitude to get larger strains? And oh. can you do that to the point where you curve down on the deep and on the deep uh, Professor Biscantine, Professor Rosette, who's working a crossword puzzle on me right now. Uh, 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 Professor Rosette, uh, uh, and uh, I, I'm not sure that uh, 
I'm going to suffer for this later, uh, um, uh, have, are doing nonlinear testing in situ. Yes, and you can do that. And they're doing it with, with spread footings, small ones, huh? We've also been doing it with drill shafts, but small ones. Uh, so you can get it at depth because immediately people are, well, you're just right next to the surface. Who cares? You know, well, okay, fine. You know, don't try to stop this right now. Just let's see what we can figure out. By the way, the main reason for doing nonlinear measurements in situ is to see how good the lab is to see if we can get rid of the nonlinear measurements in situ because they're so bloody expensive. But you got to prove it first. And you're going to find that there are cases in hard to sample materials. By the way, Yucca Mountain, cemented alluvium, we're doing it there. There you're going to have to do it in the field because of the tremendous variability and so forth that you see, yeah, in, in the lab and the difficulty in getting unbiased samples in the lab. Um, did that answer the question? I tend not to give a short answer, sorry. I have another word, this is testing. Uh, resilient modulus for pigment design. Yes. This is based solely on, uh, well, very often we can still do the samples. Yes. And uh, we do laboratory testing. And I always worry that they're so different from what's really happening in the field. What's your take on that? Are we not using the wrong modulus? Um, in the base courses, where I think where you should really be doing the resilient modulus testing, in the subgrade, you should be taking, uh, if you're doing resilient modulus testing, it should be intact specimens. I mean, it should be Shelby tubes and, and tested that way. If, if you're going to do it with the resilient modulus test, you should use local deformation transducers on the sample so you can get down to the small strains. Because as soon as you get, and you, I think, made this when we were talking today, this, this point, as soon as you get down very far below the pavement surface, the strains are, you, you said in terms of stresses, it's the same thing in terms of strains, the strains are small. If you get large strains in the subgrade, your road's dead in just a few days. I mean, this is gone, huh? So you can't have that. Okay, if it's the base that you need to know the most or has a real significant uh, impact, uh, the resilient modulus test, I think, is a reasonable test to do. We run resonant column tests. They're the same like a resilient modulus test. You can do that. You can accumulate strains, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. Um, but in the small strain, it's Young's modulus or constrained modulus, really, out, look out there. And uh, you should be able to get a very good comparison, and it would be similar to that comparison that I showed for the test fill, so in those different layers, and then we got the, the, the samples, and, and the samples and the measurements on the fill agreed very nicely. Here's one interesting point that I didn't mention uh, that comes out of that, though. Um, where do you think you find the most variability? In the lab test, you know, if you get this one right, I'm going to really feel bad because I don't need to be here, uh, but in the lab, or in the field? OK, I'm going. Uh, <laughs> you got it right. And it, and it makes a lot of sense. In the lab, how come? Because you have a small element now, and, and your small element test from different borrow areas is going to get all the variability that's in there. When you start putting it all together and you mix it and you sample it, that's what's nice about surface waves, you're sampling over a bigger area, that tends to uh, eliminate that. Now you say, well, wait a minute, or minimize it, I shouldn't say. Get a better average is the best way to put it. Um, but wait a minute, that's not, that's not right. We got that variability out there. A bloody earthquake with a thousand foot long wave doesn't care about element test. Huh? It's sampling this material. Even the nuclear island with this you know, 10 foot thick concrete pad over the big areas is sampling a big area, not this. So a better thing to use is the in situ measurements, which will show you you have less variability out there than you find in the lab. So you just have to be careful because uh, they can get you on that, so to speak. Oh, look at all this variability. Wait a minute. I need to do some in situ measurements, and I'll tell you what it really looks like for this in place material once I compact it. Now, the Zachary Department of Civil Engineering recognizes Professor Kenneth Stokey as the 16th Buchanan Lecturer and thanks him for delivering his lecture entitled The Increasing Role of Seismic Measurements in Geotechnical Engineering 
November the 14th, 2008, College Station. Thank you very much. It was very good. Thank you, Bert. I appreciate it. My honor. Thank you.